Hello, uh, welcome to Team City Technology Day 2020. Uh, my name is David Stewart. I'm a sales engineer with JetBrains Team City, and we're really glad you could join us today. Uh, we're looking forward to sharing some more information about the future of Team City uh, and showcasing some of the new uh, existing and upcoming features that you're going to be able to take advantage of uh, in your environment. Uh, I'm speaking to you today from Chicago, Illinois, uh, and I'm also pleased to be joined by my colleagues located across the globe, uh, other JetBrainers who you'll be hearing from more this afternoon. Um, we've gathered a really great roster of individuals from the JetBrains technology team, uh, from our engineering groups who will be here to help answer your questions. So I'd encourage you to post questions inside the YouTube chat. Uh, we'll be monitoring those and we'll also be hosting a Q&A period um, following each of the talks. So feel free to stick around for that. Um, we'll do a quick review of the, of the agenda in just a little bit. Um, before we get started today, I do wanna take a quick look back at some of the highlights from 2020, uh, if such a thing can exist. Um, so you know where we stand today. Uh, December feels like a lifetime ago. I was really just 11 months ago. We had our last major um, conference event where we were able to, to meet with our customers in person at uh, AWS reInvent out in Las Vegas. Uh, we're really looking forward to being able to meet with you guys again here in 2021, hopefully. Back in December, we also announced the release of our Team City Cloud private beta. Team City Cloud is our software as a service hosted version of the Team City you're probably familiar with. You will be hearing more about Team City Cloud during the presentations today, uh, so stick around for that. In March uh, 2020 came full force uh, and JetBrains, along with most of you watching, began adjusting to our new uh, remote working environment. Um, and that's presented its fair share of challenges, uh, certainly for us at JetBrains as well, but we're really pleased with the progress we've made and how we've been able to deliver on a lot of our goals uh, here in 2020. Uh, when May rolled around, we had our first major release of the year. Team City 2020.1 is currently available. Uh, we're on 2020.1.5 actually with our bug fix releases. And it did introduce some real standout features, uh, including the introduction of conditional build steps. Uh, we started bundling our Kubernetes support for cloud profiles. We also introduced um, integrations with Slack for notifications uh, and some various other integrations with Jira and Azure. Um, we won't be diving into any of the 2020.1 features in too much depth during the talks today, but if you'd like to find out more information, uh, we've got some tutorials available on our blog uh, as well as our YouTube channel. Uh, in July, Team City Cloud entered the public beta phase uh, where it currently exists. So you can uh, try Team City Cloud for free. Uh, the links are on our website. We allow you to build for free on Team City Cloud for as long as we remain in that beta period. And that really brings us to November. So we're here for Team City Technology Day. We've got a great set uh, of lineups for presentations. And I will note 2020.1 is scheduled to be released later this month. Uh, so please keep that in mind if you're considering upgrading to uh, one of the newer versions of Team City. For a larger picture of JetBrains as a whole, um, we recently celebrated our 20th year anniversary. You know, dating all the way back to 2001, we released IntelliJ, uh, and we've been building off of that platform since then, releasing a pretty substantial set of technology-specific IDEs. Uh, as well as additional tooling for developers that help make up our portfolio today. Uh, Team City was released back in 2006, which means we'll be celebrating our 15th anniversary uh, here in 2021. Uh, and you'll be hearing a lot about how we uh, dog food a lot of our own solutions here at JetBrains. And Team City isn't an exception to that rule. You know, Team City is powering the development internally at JetBrains. We host a, a build server that has uh, over a thousand build agents and runs uh, tens of thousands of jobs a day, uh, hundred thousands of jobs occasionally. Um, so stick around to hear more about that. We've continued to introduce other products into the JetBrains portfolio. 
uh, including Kotlin, which was released in 2012, continues to be a main development effort. We also have uh, issue management tools with UTRAC. Um, and most recently, we introduced a set of educational tools with JetBrains Academy and our IntelliJ EDU add-ons. So if you have kids at home who are looking to learn how to program, uh, I'm not going to guarantee it's going to be easy to get them to you know, sit in front of the computer and learn some of these skills, but the resources are available, whether it's through JetBrains tools or through um, you know, a multitude of uh, free solutions that are available out on the web. Uh, you might also hear us mention uh, JetBrains' newest project, Space, during the presentations today. This is our integrated team environment that we use internally for Git hosting, project management, uh, team communications, and more. Uh, it's currently in beta, and you can learn more about Space on our website. So some quick notes about today's events. We will be recording all of our presentations today. And over the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll begin uh, releasing them on our YouTube channel, which is JetBrains TV. Following each of the talks, we will host an open question and answer period. So please utilize the chat in the YouTube screen to ask your questions. We'll try to answer some questions during the presentations. Uh, with the JetBrainers that are standing by inside the chat. Um, but we will also ask the speakers uh, some of the questions that pop up during the presentations. We don't anticipate having any uh, scheduled breaks in our program today. If um, some of the talks, we do expect to end a little bit early. Uh, so if you're bouncing in and out of the talks today, just take a look at the schedule. We anticipate starting each of the talks uh, at the scheduled time if uh, some of the other talks end a little bit early. Uh, and then finally, if you still have questions, you can shoot us a note at teamcity-support at jetbrains.com. Uh, we'll do our best to answer those requests. We do have other ways you can engage with us as well, though. We maintain a presence on all the major social media sites uh, for JetBrains as a whole. You can check out the Team City website at jetbrains.com slash teamcity. Uh, and then we have pages on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram and LinkedIn. But what I'd recommend is if you want to engage with us more directly, utilize some of the links on the left-hand side. If you haven't had a chance to check out our blog recently, I'd highly recommend you give it a look. This is where we release most of our major announcements on new releases, new features. We also host uh, tutorials, how-tos, uh, guest blog posts. Um, so definitely check that out. Our YouTube channel is at JetBrains TV. Uh, so you can click on that little icon and check out uh, our YouTube channel at your convenience today. There is a dedicated playlist for Team City. So if you're looking to filter out the videos from all of our other tools, from uh, the Team City tools, uh, definitely give that playlist a look. Uh, our community forums are also available for general support. Uh, if you're not opening tickets directly with our support team uh, through the ticket management system or over email, uh, and then finally, I will mention our bug and issue tracker. Uh, this is really where we uh, handle most of our enhancement requests uh, and features that you'd like to see implemented. Um, so this is publicly available. Uh, what I'd recommend is give this a look. Uh, and if you have a feature or an enhancement request that you'd like to see implemented, go and vote on that feature uh, and add your comments in the comments section as well. We uh, are regularly monitoring this, and we use this as a feedback point when we're planning our future releases. Uh, there's also some good conversation happening in a lot of these issues, which may include you know, some discussion around you know, where we are with a specific issue uh, or some workarounds if we haven't implemented a specific feature yet. Um, additionally, if you encounter a bug uh, and you bring that up to support, Frequently, our support team will open up a issue in Utrack on your behalf, but you're welcome to open up your own uh, bug issues in here as well. Uh, the last thing I'll say about our Utrack instance is if you find yourselves looking for a replacement issue tracker uh, because your current issue tracker is moving to a cloud-only subscription model, Utrack is available as an on-premise solution as a part of our larger product portfolio. So you can find more information about that on our website. 
If you'd like to stay up to date with the latest uh, news and happenings in the Team City world, I would also recommend you go to our blog and sign up for our email newsletter. Uh, if you received a link to this invitation from a colleague, uh, this is how you can be notified on your own. Uh, we don't collect a ton of user information uh, about our customers. You know, Frequently, there'll be a license delivery who will get all of these emails. Uh, so if you'd like to sign up for this information on your own, definitely check that out on our website. Uh, so moving a little bit to the agenda, I'll provide a brief overview, and then I'll hand it off to uh, Yegor, who will uh, kick us off today. He'll be presenting our long-term product roadmap. Uh, and then immediately following uh, our product roadmap, uh, Alex will come in and he'll talk about specifically what's coming in Team City 2020.2. Uh, we're slated to release 2020.2 later this month. It'll be our second major release of the year uh, following our regular uh, twice a year release schedule. Uh, at 1245 um, Eastern time, uh, we'll invite Nikita to come and talk about some of our experience uh, and lessons learned in deploying Team City to the cloud. Um, Team City Cloud is, uh, you know, a really large undertaking internally here at JetBrains. We're running, you know, close to uh, 1,200 instances inside AWS. So this will be a pretty technical talk dealing with uh, how we architected this uh, environment uh, and some of the lessons we've learned along the way. Moving into the afternoon schedule uh, at 1.15 Eastern time, uh, Marco, our new developer advocate, will be on. He'll be discussing how to get started with the Kotlin DSL. So configuration as code has been uh, a huge trend in the CI CD world over the last few years. And we have had uh, configuration as code capabilities since about 2017 delivered through the Kotlin DSL. So if this is something your organization is moving to or it's something you're interested in learning more about, uh, definitely tune in for this talk. We'll be uh, starting all the way from the basics, setting up your configuration as code and version settings in TeamCity, and moving through some more advanced use cases with some live coding demonstrations um, on how to utilize the Kotlin DSL to write your configurations as code. Uh, at 2.15, Dennis will come in and he will talk about how to create new plugins uh, with our new plugin uh, UI development framework. Um, a lot of you have probably seen the new UI uh, in the various new versions of Team City. You'll hear a little bit about that in our roadmap, uh, but Dennis will specifically be talking about um, how to develop UI plugins um, inside Team City. Uh, and then finally, uh, our final talk of the day is a really interesting one. Uh, Yegor will come back and he'll talk about how we use Team City uh, to not only build Team City inside Team City, uh, but how Team City is deploying Team City, uh, deploying itself essentially. So uh, it's a really interesting talk on some of the internal development processes uh, at JetBrains. Uh, so we're really excited you could join us here today. Um, I will hand the mic over to Yegor uh, and we'll get started with um, the, the roadmap for Team City. Thanks, guys. Thanks, David. Uh, there was one quick question in the chat that I've just seen is, uh, what is the U-Track URL for the issues that you could report uh, to our team? Can yeah. you share that real quick? Yeah, let me go back. Uh, so the U-Track URL is utrack.jetbrains.com uh, slash issues. And then each of our products uh, has their own U-Track instance. Um, uh, URL inside uh, our larger JetBrains U-Track. So the Team City is located at dash TW, uh, but if you're an IntelliJ user, um, you're going to have a separate uh, link for uh, our other IDEs. Uh, this is also available on our website, um, so you can find the information there. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for the intro. I guess I'll get started with the product roadmap then. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Yegor Naumov, and uh, I'm the product marketing manager for Team City at JetBrains. And uh, today, I'd like to share uh, some of our plans, some of the things that we're working on in the upcoming uh, releases, uh, and kind of some of our ideas and uh, thoughts about how we're going to move forward as a product, as a team, over the next uh, couple of years. So there's a quick note before this presentation uh, is that this roadmap is not set in stone, so things can change, uh, circumstances can change, 
Uh, we can have uh, additional features coming in. We can have uh, some of the features dropping out of the roadmap, depending on the, uh, some of our other priorities and uh, uh, different circumstances, basically. So uh, just keep this in mind. And uh, But generally, most of the things that I'm going to talk about today are either already in development or are very soon going to be uh, added to our product uh, roadmap uh, in terms of development. Oh. So first things first, I'd like to start with just telling you how, uh, how our process works, how we release TeamCity. Uh, so in, in general, we have two major releases per year. Uh, and generally, this is uh, in, in the end of spring and in the end of uh, fall or beginning of winter. So our last release was uh, uh, in May. And our next release is uh, planned for, uh, for the end of uh, November in a couple of weeks from now, really. And uh, in between major releases, we have a number of uh, minor releases uh, where we release bug fix updates, where we release security fixes, uh, and other smaller updates to the, uh, to the version of Team City that is, uh, that's the major one. And for example, our latest uh, minor release was on October 8th, and that was uh, 2021.5. And just in case you're lost with this uh, version uh, numbering, as 2020 is the, the year, obviously. Dot one is the major version. So we either have dot one or dot two. Uh, and then it's the bug fix uh, update number. Uh, on average, we have uh, from four to six uh, bug fix updates uh, before uh, for each of the major versions. There's also uh, an early access preview uh, program that we run before each major release. Uh, basically, what this is, is uh, we uh, release a build of Team City that is uh, going, to be, uh, going to become a major release in a couple of months or in several weeks. Uh, and we let you try it out for free uh, with uh, no limitations, but for a limited number of times. So you, you can set up as many build configurations and run as many uh, build agents as you want in those EAP builds, but only for a limited number of time until this EAP program runs until we release the, the final version of it. So we generally have uh, up to three EAP uh, releases before a major release. And like currently for 2020.2, uh, which is coming soon, as I mentioned, in a couple of weeks, we're already uh, on EAP3 and it's available now. You can go to the website at jetbrains.com slash teamcity slash next version and uh, downloaded it from there. So it's a great way to play around with, with some of the new features that are going to be uh, released soon. And also, we really appreciate if you could provide us feedback because EAP builds are not final. Uh, and we, as a team, really uh, rely on, uh, on that early feedback from some of the early uh, EAP users. And we really appreciate that if you could do that, if you could provide us that feedback. Um, also, just to let you know like what our releases are uh, made of, uh, uh, one that, what they consist of is, is the TeamCity core, which is the backend and the frontend part of TeamCity, and also a set of uh, bundled plugins. So currently we have uh, over 50 bundled plugins. And what is a bundled plugin? It's basically a plugin for TeamCity, uh, which is developed and maintained by JetBrains, so by our team. It is a part of our... Um, development uh, pipeline. And actually, uh, if you visit my talk later today, I will uh, kind of dive into that a bit deeper. Uh, but generally, these, these are fully uh, part of our development pipeline. They go through all the testing, they go through uh, all the maintenance, uh, and they are released as a bundle, as a single uh, product uh, together with the Team City Core. Uh, and if you'd like to view uh, enhancements requests and the bugs uh, that are going to be fixed in the next releases, if you would like to kind of keep track of uh, uh, when or in which build uh, a certain feature going to make it into the uh, product, you can go to the same uh, U-Track instance that David has already shared with you uh, and just search through uh, it, look at the build release numbers and see what is going to make it into the uh, build pipeline. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, move on to the product roadmap. So there are several areas uh, that we focus on at this moment. And uh, 
this is not a timeline. It's just a set of, uh, of these areas that we're going to uh, talk about today. So one of them is Team City Cloud. As David has already mentioned, uh, Team City Cloud is a SaaS version of Team City that we're, we have released uh, earlier this year for, as a public beta release. Uh, and we have uh, high hopes about it, and we have we see a lot of interest from our users. Uh, so this is one of the first areas I'm going to talk about. Then the multi-server scalability is also a very important uh, uh, part and area of development for us. It kind of allows Team City to be highly scalable, uh, to be highly available on larger installations, and it provides additional instruments uh, on how to achieve that. Uh, then there is a number of core uh, CI and CD uh, improvements. Uh, and generally, historically, Team City has always been smart uh, uh, in dealing with, uh, in understanding the developer workflow and in providing some of the intelligent functionality uh, on top of it to help developers and the development teams to achieve that uh, uh, smooth and uh, frictionless CI uh, pipelines. And we're going to release more features there uh, in that uh, area. And I guess this. Every release of Team City will consist of a number of features from this area. So another area of uh, focus is the Kotlin DSL. Um, uh, configuration as code is a big part uh, of uh, what our users are looking into and using for con constructing their build configurations and keeping track of, of the settings. So uh, we are going to introduce new changes in that. And we also develop that uh, direction uh, for our product. Uh, we're also going to add a number of build runners and integrations. Uh, we're working uh, hard on the new UI, uh, codenamed Sakura, uh, and there's a number of cloud features that I'm going to talk about. Okay, so let's dive deeper into each of them. Um, first things first, Team City Cloud. Uh, it is currently in public beta, as I mentioned. Uh, the target release date, uh, the public release date is the beginning of uh, 2021. You're very welcome to check it out, sign up, and while it's in, in beta, you can uh, use it for free for unlimited, for basically unlimited number of builds and uh, and users. Uh, so what is it? It's it's the same Team City that you know and love, but it's managed by us, uh, by JetBrains, and it's hosted on AWS. Um, we either provide a full fully hosted version where you don't have to think about any build agents. Uh, or we let you bring your own build agent and connect it uh, for any custom workflows that you want to run or any custom uh, set of uh, software that you would like to utilize. Uh, well, we would like to make it easier for those customers, for those users who are who just don't want to like uh, too much deal with the maintenance of the build server and uh, just how, uh, like to enjoy building the pipelines, the build chains, uh, and like starting and running your builds. Uh, the pricing will be based on the number of active contributors. So we don't limit the number of parallel builds or the concurrency uh, that you uh, can achieve. However, uh, the pricing is going to be limited by the number of active contributors. And a cool thing is that the active contributor is not just any developer on your team or any QA engineer or DevOps engineer. It's only uh, those developers who, uh, who commit, who author at least 10 changes, uh, 10 commits over one month. So uh, that's kind of a very generous approach to, the, to this. There's going to be also a number of uh, build minutes. Uh, uh, tied to to the number of builds, uh, to the number of uh, active contrib contributors, and you will also have an option, of course, to uh, purchase those additionally. So to sign up for Team City Cloud, just uh, go to uh, jetbrains.com/teamcity/cloud and sign up for the beta. As I said, it's free uh, and it's unlimited for the time being until we are in the beta uh, stage. So another section is the multi-server scalability. And this has been a focus area for our development team over the last couple of releases. And it's going to continue to be that for the next couple of releases, at least. Uh, and the goal that we are trying to achieve is to have a fully scalable uh, Team City installation uh, with multiple nodes that are interchangeable uh, between each other. So we'd like to provide this multi-server setup. And what we started with is we are providing you an option to set up a secondary node of Team City and to offload a number of responsibilities to that node. That helps you with the uh, scalability uh, and with performance for some larger installations. And like currently, that 
what we have already released is the processing build triggers, processing data produced by run and builds, and uh, polling of uh, version control repositories. Uh, these are the, uh, the responsibilities that you can already offload to the secondary server. Uh, so what are we going to add? Um, first of all, the full featured UI. Uh, this is a feature of 2020.2, so it's uh, going to be ready very soon. And actually, Alexander will mention that uh, in his uh, talk right after this one. Uh, basically, it's, uh, we're going to move towards the full parity uh, between the main Team City node and the secondary Team City node. We'll let you, we'll let your users uh, uh, configure, build configurations, projects, etc. Also on the secondary node through the UI, not only on the primary node. Uh, another feature is the build queue processing. This is a pretty important functionality uh, uh, that will let Team City. A secondary server also process builds from the queue. So already right now you can uh, add builds to the queue. So users on the secondary node can trigger builds and they'll be added to the build queue for, but after that, uh, currently the secondary node cannot process them. So agents will not start the new builds from this queue. And this feature will let you actually start the builds from the queue. Uh, it's currently in design stage, and uh, we're looking for it to be available next uh, year, either in the first or the second major release of the year. Uh, and the third big one is the failover mode. So basically, it's uh, an automatic switch between the primary, the main node, and the secondary node whenever uh, the primary node is down for some reason, either for maintenance or it's just down for some uh, networking issue or some other issue. So this uh, this is almost uh, a step towards uh, full high availability. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this one. I think it will be many of our customers will actually appreciate this. Now onto the core CI improvements. So this feature has already been released. I just like it so much. I want to mention it again. Uh, so conditional build steps, uh, we released them uh, in May. Uh, in the 2020.1 release. And this was the most highly voted feature in our issue tracker for uh, many years. Uh, and basically what it uh, lets you do is uh, it lets you add a condition to any build step for any build runner within Team City, uh, And based on a certain parameter value, you can decide whether or not you'd like to run this build step. So it supports build parameters for both the uh, server and agent uh, parameters. Really cool. Uh, next one is the trigger defined parameters. So this uh, feature will actually let you uh, define additional logic uh, for when to trigger builds uh, based on different parameters. For example, uh, if you want to uh, if you want to trigger nightly builds only only when uh, it was uh, the previous builds were triggered by a schedule and not by any other uh, action or event, uh, you will be able to do that. So based on the triggers of what trigger, you can change the parameters and then decide the logic of what was going to happen. It's currently in development. It's going to be available in 2021, uh, either in the first or the second major release. Now the, to the testing. Uh, Team City has always been smart with how it processes tests. It gives you a lot of data about tests. It gives you test history, provides you multiple tools to uh, go through uh, when each test uh, has failed for the first time, what are the new failed tests, etc. So, and we are adding more functionality to to, to this uh, testing uh, stage as well. First one is the custom interpretation of flaky tests. This is actually going to be released uh, in twenty twenty dot two, and basically what it does, it will let you uh, define additional logic over how you want to uh, deal with the flaky test, which fail or succeed uh, based on some random uh, condition, for example, time-based uh, failures. So you will be able to uh, add a uh, option in Team City to kind of, if the test failed, but then it uh, succeeded in later build, don't fail the build itself. Uh, and the second one is the intelligent test splitting. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's a cool one. So uh, we know that Customers sometimes ask us, like, how do you parallelize your builds? Uh, how do you parallelize your build steps? And we don't have the ability to parallelize build steps because we actually usually recommend just split it into different build configurations, uh, build a build chain, and run it in parallel. But here, for some of the builds that run hundreds or thousands of tests uh, just within one build configuration, we'll actually 
provide intelligent test splitting. We'll split them into groups and utilize different agents that are not running in the builds at the moment to process those tests faster. Uh, yeah, another feature here is the agentless build steps. Uh, again, this is, you're gonna hear more about it from Alexander uh, about in the, his talk about what's coming in uh, in the next version. Uh, here for, so for some of the build configurations, we know that agents, build agents in Team City actually send their jobs elsewhere and just sit there waiting until that external uh, machine or external process is uh, being finished. For example, for deployment jobs, you might be waiting for some manual approval step. And currently, uh, Team City build agents will just sit there and it will be occupied for this whole time until you're waiting for that manual approval build step in deployments. And what we want to provide is we want to provide the ability to kind of detach those uh, builds from the build agent, free it up, and let it build, uh, let it run some other builds while that external job is still happening. So uh, this is the feature. And again, Alex is gonna tell you more about that. So on to Kotlin DSL. Uh, first of all, the, 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 one of the features in development is that we'll provide the, you an ability to view project configurations uh, as DSL from within the UI. So there is this, a little button, as you might have noticed on the configure on the settings pages, on the administration pages, uh, view DSL. So what it does, it basically shows you the current settings that you're uh, watching, uh, uh, looking at as a DSL uh, based on Kotlin. So uh, currently it's only available for uh, build configuration uh, settings and we'll make it available for project configuration settings as well. It's coming in uh, 2020.1 and as well as the per branch configurations. So currently, uh, when you have different branches, uh, Team City still uh, lets you only use a single uh, built, uh, single uh, configuration as code uh, settings file for all of them. And we have a lot of requests on, let us please uh, change those settings within different branches. And this is what we are going to provide in 2021.1. Uh, 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 and last but not least for Kotlin DSL is uh, we will add the ability to disable UI editing uh, while uh, there are settings uh, in Kotlin DSL code uh, for, for a project. So currently, as you know, uh, you can enable uh, Kotlin DSL based settings for your projects and uh, continue, still continue editing uh, settings in the UI. Uh, and we think it's a really cool feature. It gives a lot of flexibility in, uh, for different users of TeamCity to differently set up their uh, build configurations and projects. And we understand that some like uh, to do it in code, some like to do it in the UI, but when you do it in, in both, when you, do it, when you do this hybrid approach, there's a lot of uh, manual uh, patching that you need to do on the uh, Kotlin config side. You need to copy those patches of all the new change settings and apply them manually. It's sometimes is not too convenient. So we're gonna allow customers to uh, optionally disable the UI editing when the uh, version settings are enabled for your project. And uh, a smaller one uh, that is currently designed, we want to kind of simplify the configuration scripts and uh, amid you amid the imports uh, that you need to add to all your uh, settings.kts files. And uh, yeah, this is currently in design. We're not sure we'll be able to achieve it easily, but uh, uh, we're looking at next year to uh, have it ready for one of the releases. Uh, some additional improvements. We are adding new build runners. Uh, so .NET 5 build runner is going to basically replace uh, all five different .NET runners that we currently have. However, we're not gonna, uh, we're still going to keep those. Uh, it's not like we're gonna replace them and only have this one. No, we're just gonna uh, make it easier for our .NET 5 users to uh, con construct variable configurations, uh, but we're gonna uh, still have this uh, available, all the others run is available. This is scheduled for already the re next release in, uh, in November. And also we're adding a Python build runner uh, really cool, uh, supports a lot of Python uh, uh, testing frameworks and just lets you uh, work with your Python projects out of the box. And additional e ecosystem integrations are the Bitbucket Cloud. We are uh, adding a pull request support for Bitbucket Cloud. And we are also designing multiple uh, integrations with JetBrains Space, which is a uh, integrated uh, team environment from JetBrains, which is also going to be released by the end of this year. Uh, and there's a number of uh, 
kind of cloud related features, uh, not the Team City cloud, but the uh, using Team City with cloud agents with the uh, external clouds. Uh, so one is the persistent caches on cloud agents. Uh, this uh, drastically improves the speed of uh, how fast your agents spin up and start uh, running builds. Uh, as I say here, we actually uh, kind of we actually need it ourselves for Team City Cloud. So, but we're going to provide it uh, for all the users of Team City as an as an out of the box feature of uh, Team City on prem. And this currently in design will be available next year. And then there is a couple of things that we are currently exploring. First of all, uh, we hear some requests about cloud friendly licensing, uh, and we understand there are some uh, inconveniences with current licensing approach uh, to when you use multiple uh, build uh, build agents in the cloud. So we're examining different ways to provide a more flexible approach for when you run your uh, cloud profile builds. Uh, and then we're also looking at providing uh, something like volume-based discounts for agent uh, for agent purchases, for especially for larger ones. Uh, we see that uh, it might simplify the management and the procurement uh, of those licenses. And we're exploring the providing a premium support option for some of the, our large clients who probably need some uh, additional attention, uh, some additional. Uh, uh, maybe stricter SLAs, uh, urgency uh, notifications, and kind of more direct uh, access to our support team. So we're looking into all of this. And actually, if you're interested in this, please let us know, either in the issue tracker or in support, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you about what you would benefit from and hopefully provide something useful to you. Yeah, and Sakura UI, uh, as I mentioned previously, this is a large undertaking by our front-end team. Uh, it started a couple of releases ago, as you might have noticed, we started uh, adding an option to switch to this uh, new experimental UI within Team City. Uh, and this is a big step for us because this is going to be a, uh, so we are reworking both uh, technically and also visually, as you might have noticed, uh, and it's going to be uh, done in, on new technologies. Uh, it's, it renders the page on as a single page application. Uh, it should uh, perform better on larger installations and under larger load. Uh, and there's a number of features that we're, we've already implemented. We've already we've, uh, redid a lot of pages uh, within the Team City, and there's a num number of them on the roadmap as well, such as the build queue page, for example, the header. As you can see here, it's, uh, uh, it's the dark mode header. So uh, yeah, this will also be available. Uh, and some additional uh, administration pages and so on. And actually, during this day, during uh, some of the talks, you might see different combinations of the new UI and the old UI and the screenshots. So just uh, don't be scared, it's, uh, it's fine. Uh, it's just uh, some people use different uh, UIs and hopefully if you haven't seen this yet, you can uh, take a look at it and find it useful. Uh, just if you're not using it, if you've never seen it yourself, uh, you can uh, enable it in your uh, profile or ask your Team City administrator to do that. And uh, then each of the users will can make this choice themselves, whether or not to switch to, to the new UI or to stay with the classic UI. Um, and yeah, I think this is all mostly it. Uh, I just wanted to say that everything that I talked uh, uh, about right now is uh, available on our website. We have released this public roadmap page. Just go to jetbrains.com slash teamcity slash roadmap and uh, you can uh, see this whole list, basically what I just uh, presented to you uh, on the page. We try to keep it updated. We try, we try to uh, add the things that we're working on uh, to that page. We try to update uh, the statuses of different features and. Uh, kind of have this overview for you and other customers to uh, take a look at and kind of know and understand what is going to happen to the product over the course of the next several releases. And I will uh, say it again, uh, repeat after David, please share your feedback. Uh, a lot of these features that you've heard about today are made it into the roadmap because of the user feedback that we collected. We are happy to receive it on the, our issue tracker. Just go to the utrack.jitbrains.com slash issue slash TW, or just go to the utrack and select Team City project there. 
And uh, you can file a feature request, you can file a bug report, you can file an idea, a question. Uh, we'll be happy to process that. And uh, we cannot recommend, I mean, we cannot uh, guarantee that anything you ask for will make it into the roadmap. Of course, it doesn't work this way, but uh, I can assure you that every time we plan our next release or a number of next releases, we uh, take user feedback into account. And that's usually a very big factor. That's it for me. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. I can, I guess, take a couple of questions if there are any. David? Yeah, thanks, Igor. This is uh, really helpful. So we do have a couple of questions from the chat. Uh, we will be reiterating some that we've already answered in the messages for the video stream uh, for those who are catching the recording of this. Um, let's start off with uh, the secure UI, Igor. Uh, can you talk a little bit about when we're expecting full feature parity between the new UI uh, and the old classic UI? Where, where are we on that timeline right now? Yeah, as I said, we started working on it about a year ago, maybe a bit more. And I think we're looking at least for the one more year to catch up. Uh, but when I say catch up, it's not like we're just copying whatever we had and uh, reintroducing it in the new UI. We are also coming up with new approaches, with new additional views, additional pages that can be helpful. So for example, is a good example of that. It's, it's how we approach build chains. Uh, it's This part of the UI is not yet fully finished, but if you go to the dependencies tab in your builds, you can already see how we introduced a couple of new views for those build chains. So. Uh, yeah, I could, we don't have a hard date on when we're going to switch, but anyway, it's not going to probably happen during the next year. And even when it happens, uh, we are still going to keep the option because we know that uh, some users still prefer to stay with the classic UI, and we will just have an option uh, to switch back to the classic UI for quite a long time. I don't have the exact date at this moment, but this will be uh, available uh, for most of our users for a long time. Right, and that was the next question that popped in. Will you be able to switch back to the old UI? Yeah, and the answer is yes. We're going to keep the classic UI uh, inside Team City for for a considerable amount of time. You know, one of there are some limitations in the classic UI, which is why we've chosen to move forward with this new UI with some modern technologies that are going to be able to load faster and also allow us to implement some new features. Um, so as we move forward with the new UI, uh, you may notice some new features being introduced into the new UI that you won't get in the classic UI. But yeah, just to reiterate, we, we do plan on keeping that uh, classic UI in Team City uh, long into the future. Um, another question here, uh, and I answered this in the chat, what will the pricing be for Team City Cloud? Um, and I guess before you answer, you know, we uh, won't be focusing a whole lot on Team City Cloud outside of our roadmaps here today. We don't want to make this a sales pitch. There's going to be organizations that are going to be ready to move uh, and want to move to a hosted environment for Team City. And there's going to be organizations that are really happy with their existing on-premise installation. Um, we do have preliminary pricing available for Team City Cloud uh, on our website. Uh, Jaeger, could you talk a little bit um, about the key metrics that uh, users will want to take into account that will uh, help contribute to uh, the pricing for Team City Cloud. Uh, sure. So yeah, as David mentioned, there is a preliminary pricing available at jetbrains.com/teamcity/cloud. Uh, so the starter plan will start with uh, a default three active contributors. Uh, there is a fixed price of sixty dollars per month for that, and what it includes it actually includes uh, a number of build credits, storage, and uh, data transfer. So. All those parameters are fixed for the number and tied to the number of active contributors that you have. So for example, as I said, three active contributors on the starter plan uh, give you 21 build credits, 21,000 build credits, uh, 30 gigabyte of storage, and 150 gigabyte of data transfer per month. And what it means, uh, and why do we have those credits? You might be familiar with those maybe from some other CIs out there, but uh, generally it's it's our approach to how we limit the number of uh, build time. Because we provide different uh, build machines, you can build like on Linux and Windows and Mac, not right now, but in the future. Uh, and you can also choose between those, like how many uh, RAM, how much RAM you might, your machine want, might have, or how many CPUs, and depending on that, the price of each build minute will be different. So just for reference, 
10 build credits per minute on the cheapest uh, Linux machine machine right now, and about 40 build credits for the Windows machine at the moment. Uh, in addition to that, you will be able uh, to purchase all those additional resources as you wish. And I think a very, very important um, point to mention here is that first, you can bring your own build agents and just connect them uh, to Team City Cloud for a, fix, for a fixed price per month. And this is not yet even uh, uh, depicted on our, on our website, but uh, we want to provide you an option to prepay uh, uh, our cloud machines before. And so basically we are looking for, to give you more flexibility in terms of how you can utilize Team City Cloud, how you can actually save money on that, especially if you know that you're gonna run regular jobs, for example, on Linux or Windows on a specific machine. So you can, you can plan your budgets. Great. Uh, so another question from the chat. Are there any plans to update the VMware uh, plugin for cloud profiles? I assume that's what you mean in the, the chat. Um, so there are a lot of enhancement requests on our U-Track instance around VMware. I think what we would need to do is understand um, your use case a little bit more uh, and where we're you know, not meeting expectations with your VMware plugin. So if you want to get in touch with us directly, um, we're happy to take a look at it. Just shoot a note to uh, support. Mention you saw something on uh, the YouTube channel today. Uh, and we're happy to get you some more information. And just to add to that, we actually use the VMware integration ourselves internally. I actually mentioned that in my later talk today. So we we almost we basically use it every day, and uh, we appreciate any feedback on it. As David said, uh, just chime in on one of those uh, U-Track issues. Um, all right, working through some of the questions. Um, here's one. With the conditional build steps, what's the recommendation on how to decide uh, between choosing conditional build steps in your build configurations versus creating a whole separate configuration uh, for, a, for a different chain? Um, and I believe this was answered pretty well in the chat by one of our developers. Uh, one of the notes, when you are configuring a conditional build step, there's going to be less visibility on when a certain condition is running inside the build log than you get in an individual configuration. So I don't have a whole lot to add on top of uh, our engineering team's comments. Uh, Yegor, probably not as well. Yeah, that's a pretty uh, solid answer. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, conditional build steps has obviously been in our U-Track instance for a while. So this is one of the considerations where, you know, there were a lot of internal conversations happening on if we implement this, what are the ramifications for how people configure their builds? Uh, and we really wanted to avoid a situation where uh, people were using bad practices to configure builds. Uh, so while we did finally add it, you know, there were some internal reservations on uh, is this going to create uh, or encourage bad practices in your build configuration. So something to keep in mind. Uh, let's see, moving down. Can we have Team City agents to trigger a build on the free space, space available since the free disk space feature have hangs if there's no space available for cleanup? Um, and I didn't read this ahead of time, so I'm not sure if I have an answer for you there, Hersha. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can see I'm the question. I'm not sure either. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm okay. not seeing this question right now. But maybe we could get back to you in the chat and uh, answer a bit, a bit later. Yeah. Sure. Um, so there are some other questions in the chat. We'll have our team take a look and try to answer some of those questions over the um, course of the next uh, few minutes. Um, for now, uh, let's go ahead and turn it over to our next presentation. I'd like to invite Alexander to the stage here. Uh, Alexander will be talking a little bit about um, what's coming directly in TeamCity 2020.2, scheduled for release later this uh, uh, this month. Uh, take it away, Alex. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. I can see that there are 145 people watching the stream right now. That's so nice. Nice to meet all of you. Uh, my name is Alexander. I'm a marketing manager of TeamCity. Uh, as Yegor said, uh, two times a year we release a new major version of TeamCity. And today I'm here to tell you about the new features in TeamCity 2020.2, uh, which will be released in just uh, several weeks from now, in the end of November. 
Before I start, I want to say that uh, we are still several weeks from the release, and there is a probability that not 100% of these features uh, will make it into the release. Uh, and for every feature uh, for which I'm not sure about, uh, I will mention it in the presentation. Okay, so as you can see, we've got a lot to cover. So let's get started with every developer's very first interaction with Team City, the login screen. And uh, the first thing that you'll notice here are these uh, GitHub, Bitbucket, and GitLab icons. And uh, as you would expect, they allow you to authenticate on the Team City server using external credentials. After you click the icon, you are redirected to the external service and log in there. The service then returns your email address, and if Team City recognizes the email, you will be authenticated as the respective user. And uh, if the email is unknown, then not. Or you can set up uh, Team City to create a new user profile for you. This is configured in the authentication settings uh, using uh, the new HTTP modules. Uh, and uh, these modules uh, support internal user directory features of the services, such as GitHub organizations and uh, GitLab groups. And uh, Team City administrators, of course, have full control over all these users, and they can even manually map uh, external user accounts with existing Team City users. And uh, one more thing about these new authentication features is that we will also support on-premise installations of GitHub and GitLab. These two are still in development, but they should make it into the release. Next, uh, let's take a look at new integrations. As you probably heard, Atlassian recently announced the retirement of Bamboo Server. And uh, we see that a lot of developers started to look out for other on-premise solutions that can work with Bitbucket or Bitbucket Cloud. Team City has been supporting Bitbucket for a really long time already. But what makes uh, Team City 2020.2 even better is that we're adding support for Bitbucket Cloud pull requests. And uh, this brings us to supporting pull requests or merge requests in four services now. Uh, so GitHub, GitLab, Azure DevOps, and Bitbucket. Our Team City inside its UI will show you details on each PR, uh, automatically run the build and to give you all other related features such as you can, for example, auto-merge uh, the new code if the build is successful. Uh, there is one limitation related to Bitbucket that is important to know. Uh, it's uh, that for Bitbucket, we will support only pull requests that are made in the same repository, not uh, from the forks. Next, uh, let's turn to build runners. Team City 2020.2 provides the all new build runner for Python. Uh, the new build runner automatically detects Python installations on build agents and uh, allows running Python programs. Uh, it works on all supported platforms on Windows, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, and uh, you can run uh, Python build step in a virtual environment are uh, using pipenv or virtual env or docker is supported as well. Uh, there is a variety of tools. The runner supports all common testing frameworks and code inspection tools. If you were using the old plugin to run your Python projects, then you can see that uh, the new runner has many more features. And uh, we recommend all users of the old plugin to move to the new Python runner. It is bundled, so it will be available in Team City out of the box, no installation required, and it will be further supported by our team. The results of your Python builds and tests are reported in the Team City UI in the same way how it works with all other build runners. You can see what changed, uh, analyze failures, assign investigations, and uh, use all your favorite features of Team City. And uh, of course, you can set up uh, builds with the new Python runner using the Kotlin DSL. Uh, if you already know how to set up configurations as a Kotlin code, then it should be easy for you. 
And by the way, if uh, you're not familiar with setting up your CI CD as code or want to refresh, uh, then you got to check out uh, this talk by my colleague Marco later today. At 1.15 uh, EST time, he will take you for a deep dive into the Kotlin DSL scripts for Team City configuration. Next uh, is support for JetBrains space in commit status publisher. Uh, so as already mentioned today, uh, you may have heard that our company has recently announced a new product called Space. Space is an integrated team environment that comes with a lot of different tools for modern software development. It is currently in EAP in early access program, so it's not publicly released yet, but the public release is coming soon. And uh, at JetBrains, we do a lot of dog fooding, which means that we use our own tools to develop our own tools. And Space uh, is not an exception. It's one of the main tools that we use internally for sharing knowledge, for hosting code. It has a, a built-in Git repository uh, for doing code reviews and much more. And uh, TeamCity 2020.2 comes with an integration with Space. Its uh, commit status publisher build feature now allows uh, to automatically publish status of your builds uh, to your JetBrain Space project. Uh, this happens in real time, or it works very smoothly and basically helps us get feedback faster and do things faster. So this is what CI is all about. That's it for integrations. And next, I want to tell you about some core CI improvements. Uh, and the big news here is agentless build steps. So what is it? Let's take a look. Team City has a lot of features. It integrates with a lot of tools. Uh, it has a lot of plugins and integrations, and it can be used to build, or test, deploy pretty much all sorts of projects. But what if your release pipeline employs an external service? So imagine that there is an external deployment service that requires a lot of time to complete its job. Probably even has a manual approval step, something like this. So after you call it from a Team City build agent, and as you know, all the work is done by Team City build agents. So in this situation, you could spend hours or probably even days or just waiting for this job to finish or for somebody to approve the release. And this build agent will remain unused because it will have to wait for this external job to finish. And wouldn't it be cool if it was possible to execute external jobs without occupying Team City build agents? And well, in Team City 2020.2, we're doing just that. Now, your builds uh, can send a special instruction to release the agent, uh, and the agent becomes available so it can run other builds. And this remaining step, it completes in the agentless mode. One important note here is that this is an advanced feature because you will, of course, want uh, to see the progress of this agentless step in the Team City UI and know when it's finished. And uh, to do it, you will have to make sure that this external service, uh, which could be your own custom script, which makes it easier. But anyways, you need to make sure that uh, this external service reports back to Team City. For, and for this, we are providing a new REST API on the Team City server, which external services can use to report the build status and progress. So yeah, this is how it works. The number of agentless build steps that you can run depends on the number of agent licenses that you have on your server. So if you're using the professional version of Team City, which is free, then you can run your common three builds on three agents and also run three tasks on external services. And if you're using the enterprise version of Team City, say with uh, 10 agent licenses, then you can simultaneously run 10 builds on 10 agents. And in addition to that, run 10 agentless build steps. So the number of agentless build steps equals to the number of agent licenses. 
That's it for agentless builds. Now let's talk about tests. Failed tests don't always mean broken code. Often, if your test passes at least once over several runs, this means that the code works correctly. For example, your UI test uh, may fail due to a network problem, but succeed on the second run. And you will, of course, want to mark it as successful because there are, there are no rendering problems and uh, the failure is not related to the error in the code. And Team City has always had a strict policy about failed tests. So any test, any test failure always resulted in a failed build step. And this is, of course, not convenient in many testing scenarios. Uh, and to support more workflows, version 2020.2 will allow you to choose how to deal with these situations. Uh, so you can keep your build green, even if some tests appear flaky within the same build. This feature can be enabled in the failure conditions section on the build configuration settings. And uh, yeah, I've seen some comments in the chat earlier. Uh, and uh, yeah, we think that many developers will find it very useful for their workflows. Multi-server capabilities. So, you know, you can make multiple Team City servers work together in a cluster. And uh, yeah, you do this to get a higher level of performance and reliability. And this is primarily required for very large installations with hundreds and thousands of built agents. Uh, our goal here is to enable your team to keep working with Team City while the primary server is under maintenance. And in version 2020.2, we're adding three new features. First, secondary nodes now allow you to edit project level settings. Second, they now allow you to edit global server settings. And finally, we're also allowing plugin developers to implement plugins that work on secondary nodes. This third feature uh, is still in development, work in progress, and it may not make it into the release, but hopefully it will. Next, let's move to administration. The cleanup feature it became more powerful. It now supports cron-like expressions, so you can now customize the schedule of the server cleanup. Uh, so it can start with any necessary regularity, for example, on weekends or twice a day or whatever you want. Then there are improvements to the disk usage monitor. Uh, we see that an increasing number of our users prefer storing build artifacts in the cloud, for example, in Amazon S3. And to address this demand, uh, we have improved the disk usage monitor, and now it supports external storage. So Team City now detects not only local, but also remote artifact directories configured on the server and analyzes the disk space occupied by builds in all of these storage locations. Uh, next is access tokens. Sometimes you need an access token for a very short time, for example, to run in, in some scripts. And once the token is issued, you have to remember to revoke it after scripts finished. And starting with version 2020.2, Team City allows you to generate time-limited access tokens. So you can use these tokens in scripts or REST API requests, and after the token's uh, time limit expires, Team City will automatically revoke it. And uh, there is one more related feature. It's in development right now. Uh, we're planning to allow creating tokens with different permissions. So for example, tokens uh, that can be used only to access build artifacts or to only run builds but not stop them and so on. So it's not yet clear if we will finish this uh, feature before the release, but uh, you should know that we're working on it. And finally, let's talk about the new UI. Uh, so you know that last year we introduced a new experimental UI codenamed Secura. Uh, the problem with our old UI is that 
it was built using technologies that are now over 10 years old. So it reached its limits a very long time ago, and it's becoming harder and harder for us to maintain it. And uh, the new UI, on the other hand, it's fast, it's uh, uh, built using modern technologies, and it allows us to develop new features easier and uh, ship them faster. Uh, if you haven't yet checked it out, then I, I highly recommend you to do so. Uh, to turn on the secure UI, all you got to do is click this uh, blue icon in the top right corner of the screen, and uh, it will be enabled for you. Or you can just uh, turn it on in your UI settings. These are per user settings, and it won't affect all other users on your service, but only you yourself. So what's new? The first thing that we're changing is the header. And as you can see, it is now dark, it's black. I, I think it's beautiful and it doesn't look like software from early 2000s. <laughs> in fact, we liked it so much that in TeamCity 2020.2, we're going to replace it in the old UI as well, not only in the experimental UI. Uh, then we are working on a completely new build queue page. So for each queued build, you will be able to see the changes, uh, the agent where the build will run, the estimated time when it will be started, what triggered the build, and uh, all other important information. You can select builds that you don't need and remove them from the queue, or, or vice versa, move them on the top. This is still work in progress, but I really hope that we will make it into the release. Uh, and yeah, one important thing that I want to say here, that here and in all other places in the secure UI, we take great care to make sure that the new page, like this build queue page, has all the features and supports all the use cases of the classic UI. So if you're switching from the all UI, there's nothing that you will miss. Next, next is the new test history page. It looks fresh. Uh, it also has this nice redesigned bar chart that gives you statistics on, uh, on your test. Yeah. On the build dependencies page, we have improved two things. The timeline view now shows not only finished and started builds, as it did earlier, but also queued builds. And the build chain view now shows their builds dependencies from other builds. I think these two views are great. They really help you understand the big picture of how your software is built and uh, how your pipelines really work. And uh, yeah. If you haven't seen them, you should go and check them out. Also, we have implemented build log search. This was one of the most popular requests from our users. And now it became so much easier to browse the build log and debug your CI setup and find errors. And uh, I think that this is one of those experiences that make you really start loving to use the product. So it's super convenient to work with and you should check it out as well. And the last thing that I want to mention is the new plugin framework that allows you to develop your own plugins for the secure UI. Later today, there will be a talk by my colleague, Dennis, at 2.15 EST time where he will tell you more about plugin development. So that's it for 2020.2. Let me recap. We now allow to authenticate using external OAuth providers. Currently, we support GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket. There are new integrations, uh, Bitbucket Cloud pull requests, uh, new build runner for Python, and JetBrains space in commit status publisher. Core CI improvements. These are agentless build steps uh, and the feature that allows you to mark flaky tests within one build as successful. 
uh, new features for multi-server setup. So secondary nodes are now not read-only, but allow editing project level settings and global level set global server settings. Uh, new administration features, uh, customizable cleanup schedule, support for external storage in disk usage monitor and time-limited access tokens. And last but not least, many, many improvements to the new Secura UI. So these, of course, are the highlights of Team City 2020.2, but also there are hundreds of bug fixers and other minor changes and improvements. And uh, yeah, that's it for my talk. I hope you liked what you've heard here. And now you know what you will get after updating to Team City 2020.2. A lot of these features are already available in EAP. You can find the download link on our blog at blogjetbrains.com slash teamcity. Uh, also, subscribe for our blog to not miss the release announcement. Or you can also follow us on Twitter or just subscribe for product updates on the Team City product page on the JetBrains website. Yeah, and that's it. I don't know. Uh, we must have uh, some time left to answer a couple of questions. Yeah, we, we have a little bit of time. Thanks, Alexander. This was uh, really helpful. Um, so there's a lot of good discussion happening in the chat right now. Um, so I don't want to take away from some of that. A lot of that is focused on some of the existing features that are already in Team City. Uh, in some ways, you may be able to utilize them in the future. So I don't think we'll dive into a whole lot, a whole lot of that during the presentation today. Um, do have some questions for you, Alexander. Uh, one of the things you mentioned is, you know, this is just a subset of some of the features that are going to be available in the 2020.2 release. Um, if I wanted to find out more information about some of the bugs that are being fixed or some of the minor changes that maybe weren't discussed there, is there a way uh, for for me to see what, what else is included in that release? Oh, yeah, sure. So as we mentioned earlier uh, today, we have a public issue tracker. So you can just, uh, the link should be in the chat. Uh, you can just go to the public issue tracker and see all the features that are in the works right now and all the bugs that we're working and find the versions where they will be fixed. And also with every release that uh, we make, we publish release notes and we list all the links to all these issues in our issue tracker. And you can just uh, go and find uh, everything. And if there's some specific bug that you want to report, just don't hesitate to go and create the respective issue. OK, great. Um, so moving back to some of the other releases, you mentioned that we're adding our own Python build runner. Um, PyTests are pretty commonly used inside uh, Python environment. Are those going to be uh, natively supported inside the Team City testing UI the same way uh, J unit, X unit is supported right now. Uh, yes, uh, the Python integration it uh, just uh, supports pretty much everything that uh, we could uh, support. <laughs> so all the major use cases for common uh, Python development workflow are supported in the new Python runner, and we just recommend it to go and check it out. It supports virtual environments, pip and virtual env. Uh, different versions of Python, PyTest, uh, linters, uh, uh, and everything else. All right. the common tools. Excellent. Um, early in the talk, you talked a little bit about uh, the high availability multi-node setup that's, that's available. So I want to touch on that for a minute, because I think it's a feature, um, at least in my conversations with our customers, a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, so, you know, if you are running a large Team City instance and uh, you are looking for either some import, uh, performance improvements or uh, running a high availability setup, as Alexander mentioned, we aren't there yet, right? We're not 100% to a full high availability setup, but we do support a multi-node architecture. 
Um, so with that multi-node architecture, as you saw on the slide, you can run two Team City server instances uh, and delegate some of the responsibilities between those two instances. So I don't think there's a question there. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that so uh, I don't have to keep talking about it on my, my phone calls with the customers. Um, let's see what else we have here. If you have additional questions in the chat about the talk, uh, feel free to let us know. We do have about a 30 minute break coming up uh, before uh, our next talk uh, by Nikita. Uh, that one is going to start at 1245 Eastern time. Um, but I think what we will do uh, is our engineering team, uh, some of our developers are gonna stick around. So uh, we'll use the next 30 minutes, uh, we'll go offline. We'll use the next 30 minutes sort of as uh, an open chat hours. Um, I think there's a lot of good conversation happening in the chat. I will say the 200 character limit uh, is a little bit limiting uh, as far as being able to answer these in full depth. So uh, if you want to reach out to us, again, we're available at our uh, JetBrains dash or TeamCity-support at JetBrains.com, or you can open a U-Track instance. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll take a 30-minute break. We'll see you at 1245, uh, and we'll stick around in the chat if you have additional questions. Uh, thanks again, Alexander. Appreciate it. Thanks, David.
Okay, great. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're going to move forward with our next talk of the afternoon. Um, I'd like to invite Nikita. Uh, he's going to be giving a presentation on some of the lessons we learned deploying Team City Cloud uh, into AWS. So while this talk is not specific to uh, our Team City Cloud offering, you know, I think there's going to be some uh, really helpful lessons if you're also running uh, some infrastructure in AWS. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Nikita. Uh-oh, I can't hear you. Hopefully that's not just me. Yegor, up, down. <laughs> yeah, it uh, looks like Nikita is having some uh, microphone issues for a while. So I guess we can maybe discuss uh, what you're expecting from this talk. I mean, we've seen, we've both seen the test run of it. So uh, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. I, I think Team City Cloud has been a really interesting experience for us uh, <laughs> internally here at, here at JetBrains, right? We um, offer a few other services in the cloud as well. Utrack uh, is also available as a cloud offering, but you know this is one of our first major um, initiatives into uh, a cloud software as a service offering. So um, you know I'm excited that we're going to be able to offer Team City with flexible delivery models. Um, uh, and I know Nikita's excited to uh, be able to share some of our uh, experiences in, in standing that type of infrastructure up. Uh, hello, yeah. hello. Yeah, there we you can are. hear you. I'm terribly sorry. Yeah, uh, my issues as always. So um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nikita, and I'm a DevOps engineer at Team City Cloud Initiative. And today, I would like to speak about some of the lessons we learned so far running Cloud Beta in AWS. Um, a bit of history first. Uh, Team City is a cloud-based offering, uh, has some history. It's not the first time Team tries to come up with the Team City Cloud. So back in 2017, there were plans to provide a multi-tenant installation, uh, which resulted in a test drive project hosted at teamcity.jetbrains.com. But for different reasons, it has been discontinued. So um, the test drive ran for quite a while. And some of the architectural decisions behind TeamCityJetBrains.com, which is currently active and still supported some of the open source projects are built there, then were reused in the beginning of the TeamCity Cloud and its current implementation. So um, Cloud Initiative got relaunched in September 2019. And by the end of the year, we had a working prototype. And this time, we picked a bit different approach with each client receiving a standalone Team City instance, which we manage from the lifecycle perspective. And we host databases, we host agents. And um, well, we launched a private invite based beta this February, and it went well until we rolled out better publicly in July, and we are still in a public beta phase. Um, this slide depicts the trend. We have new signups each day with average for around 15 instances per day in October, four weeks in October. So uh, we get some very valuable feedback. And so far, uh, the public beta taught us a couple of very useful lessons, which we are willing to share because they might help hosting an on-premise installation in AWS. So this is a primary purpose of this talk. Um, let's start with a high-level overview of to see Team City architecture. So every server is basically a Tomcat hosting a Team City process. All of this is wrapped in a JVM and hosted in a JVM compatible environment which could be an open JDK Docker image or Coreto image, for example. So clients, users, and build agents, they are communicating with the server via URLs, via HTTP and both HTTPS, which are supported. And it is not necessary for server to have route to agents, so communication can be unidirectional. It utilizes um, locally mounted storage uh, for, for logs, for project data, for plugins, for caches, uh, all of this could be an NFS mount. Of course, uh, performance should be taken into consideration because uh, storing caches on network storage, network attached storage is not always a good idea. So uh, also a critical part of the whole application is this database. 
which uh, Jamcity uses in JDBC driver to communicate with a external SQL database, which can be MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, or Postgre. So, um, although they do provide the ability to use HSQL DB as a storage, it's not production ready solution, so it's not here. And finally, um, the critical part is the artifact storage, which can be, again, which can be a local amount, but it can be a cloud based storage as well, for example, S3. Uh, this is set per project, so uh, basically one team city server can have both local storage and both cloud-based storage. Um, as mentioned previously, Team City Cloud already had a concept and a base architecture, so Team City JetBrains was a predecessor to this. So in the beginning, we already knew what we should focus on. So um, we already had a vision of what services in Amazon we can use, start to use. Uh, so this is an elastic box store to provide volumes to virtual machines, elastic file system to provide uh, storage between different containers, for example, and that's free for artifact storage. We use MySQL hosted as a relational database service instance. And for application hosting, currently we use Elastic Container Service, which is in turn based on the EC2 machines powered by auto scaling groups and it's paired with application load balancer currently and we also use different uh, amazon services like route 53 for dns hosting both public namespaces and private namespaces for service discovery for example and systems manager for parameter storage or to provide us ourselves with the remote access to virtual machines so um, this is how Team City Cloud looks in Amazon in general. So every Team City instance is a separate ECS managed uh, Docker container. It is available only via the HTTPS um, through application load balancer and outbound internet access is provided through NAT instances for both servers and both cloud hosted agents. Um, we create a separate schema per client and each client has an isolated user. So actually each client is limited to a single schema for, of course, for isolation, for security purposes. Same actually applies to any shared resource we use. For example, if we're talking about shared artifact storage, each client is isolated uh, based on identity access management policies. Um, so this is the principle we apply to every uh, every kind of shared service we use in Team City Cloud. Um, an important thing to mention is that we actually manage Team City Cloud using a Team City and uh, a couple of management services, management APIs, we call them. Uh, they are actually responsible for storing the metadata about environment like number of clients or sharding data like how much more space we have in databases or load balancer to make decision to scale or not um, so i won't dive much into details of how managers are designed because it's still a work in progress and it's kind of out of scope of the current topic but behind them we have an actual execution environment where we actually execute our infrastructure is code automation, which is currently Terraform and a couple of uh, more API calls. And actually a whole um, automation runs through URL hooks. So when a client asks for a new Team City server via the forum, we actually create a couple of API calls and we create uh, deployments via the Team City server. So this is how it looks. So um, we have a separate Team City instance which performs the uh, the jobs, which in turn uh, create the instances, assign instances to clients, and 
this instance can also upgrade itself on on the fly. So after all, it's the way Team City Cloud client is just a separate instance, uh, although it's of course isolated. Um, and also, there is no mistake on the slide. We're currently running our processes to migrate uh, to Elastic Kubernetes service. I will talk a bit more about this later, but we, as of now, we think that it scales better for our needs. Um, moving on to the actual lessons we learned. So primarily um, networking, VPCs and some nets. Um, Initially, the network design was pretty straightforward, so all resources use it, NAT gateway or internet gateway, if applicable, if it's a public subnet, for outbound access with a default route configured. As simple as that. So this approach, of course, had negative effects when it started to scale. Uh, utilizing NAT gateway uh, has become, for us, unpredictable in terms of costs for both outbound and inbound uh, network utilization. And especially since by default, can't predict the amount of data or location uh, where we download or upload this because we run client code within the agent network. Um, we understood that we should move on from the NAT gateway. Apart from that, of course, a default routing did not consider our default network flows like agent to S3 upload or download from Elastic Container Registry to Elastic Container Service. When we start a uh, Team City server on a new machine, of course, we had we have to download quite a big image. Um, and obviously, in the beginning, we also ran into some negative calculation errors because if we want to extend uh, our functionality with things like service discovery, uh, private namespaces, they require more network interfaces within the VPC and this requires more addresses. So uh, the VPC size should be estimated from the beginning. Uh, so possible solutions to these problems were NAT instance, which is a separate EC2 machine, virtual machine configured via auto scaling group and it's based on the official image and it works pretty well. Um, as for a default routing, we uh, moved on to VPC endpoints, which are actually locally available uh, routes uh, for any AWS service we use. There's quite a lot of services available, uh, but for us, it was very important to not use NAT instance while accessing Elastic Container Registry and S3. And of course, uh, we just carefully repicked subnets, added additional CIDR blocks, and uh, in the end, we just redesigned our whole VPC when we migrated to uh, Elastic Kubernetes service. And Moving on to application load balancing, um, being ECS clients we relied heavily on out of the box integration, which has actually a service definition, which contains link to target group, which is linked to a listener, which is a part of the load balancer. So in this case, Elastic Container Service runs a lot of uh, requests to Elastic Load Balancing to just check on the target health uh, when the cluster is scaled, when we're and we are currently running like a fifteen hundred uh, services, so uh, at this scale, it creates a lot of requests, and we easily ran into throttling exceptions, and we still are running into them from time to time. We just need to uh, ask for a service limit request from the Amazon support team and also since every ECS service in this case requires a separate rule so a DNS entry a host header which points to a dynamically generated target group name we have to create a lot of different rules on application load balancers and there is a hard limit 
we can create more than 100 client specified rules. So load balances should be sharded when we're running ECS with application load balancing integration. Regarding storage, uh, in general, everything that went wrong was related so far was related to incorrect prediction for burstable workloads. So some parts of stateful data were stored in Elastic File System for containers. And although in general application does not require fast disk in these areas, in situation when a lot of applications perform their disk related related activities on the start, for example, simultaneously. If S throughput gets exhausted quickly, so um, you should carefully calculate what you need because you may need to create a provisioned to set uh, performance tire to provisioned performance or one should control burstable workloads in different way. So the monitoring should be set up accordingly because we still need to track exact number of client connections and of course a throughput utilization we can set up a warning that we're running low on the throughput and we need to decide to scale or not so um, um, apart from that in the beginning of the project there was also no nice features like efs access points which are available now and according ecs integration as well so we had to perform EFS mounting on the start of the container instance machine. And this requires setting up alerts for EFS client connections carefully because obviously uh, this number should be equal to number of servers that are mounting EFS. Otherwise, you can run into data issues. And apart from that, uh, S3-wise, we need to create a reusable policy, well, try at least try to create a reusable policy to manage S3 access. More on that a bit later. Um, more about Elastic Container Services um, is that we actually use AWS Log Driver along with Log4j to send logs from the Team City to offload them and visualize them then, but. Um, this worked well until eventually, for some reason, logs.amazonaws.com stopped responding in time, which resulted in Team City kind of getting locked because that log collection fails. So it's uh, necessary to consider that logging can lock out the application. There is a solution to that. It's one of the solutions to just set the AWS logs to non blocking mode, which can result in losing some of the log entries, but at least won't lock out the application. And um, more about Elastic Container Service. Um, ECR mentioned Elastic Container Registry issue mentioned earlier was a result of simultaneous cold start of, the, of a lot of machines. So every machine downloaded quite a big image. And if there is an NAT instance of small size and instance types in Amazon, they are different with network throughput, uh, of course, CPU and memory. And um, this may result into quick exhaustion of the network throughput. So this also may be solved with the creation of VPC endpoint for Elastic Container Registry URLs, uh, API URLs and uh, metadata URLs and actually download URLs. Uh, besides that, S3 access is also should be con configured internally to avoid these issues. And so moving on, TeamCity also may open a lot of files in some cases. So your limits should also be configured accordingly. It, does not apply only to ECS, it just applies to any TeamCity server running in a container. And yes, as I've already said, we recommend using local endpoints if the workload of your TeamCity server requires uploading a lot of data to S3. And about roles about identity access management. Um, 
we would advise to consider hard limits on policy attach attachments and from number of roles because these are hard limits and we think that application that does not in fact need to have access to s3 on execution phase again if we are talking about running this in a container for example in ecs but it does need access to elastic container registry for example so it's a nice idea to differentiate this in elastic container service on execution role and um, task role so far we've also created an IAM role per client, which is good from security perspective, systems manager access, S3, VPC access, but at scale, this may result into running in a hard limit of 5,000 roles per AWS account. So uh, although for us currently, this is not a big issue, we have some more room. Uh, we think that it's generally a good idea to um, implement attribute based access which can help a lot and um, identity access management service can now uh, actually provide dynamically set variables in each request which is cool because based on this we can uh, create a generalized role which can be easily reused and you don't need to create a client specific role anymore just out of the box you have a client specific tag for example which can help a lot it unfortunately it does not help in elastic container service where we don't have access to managing the actual api call to iam when the container starts but we're looking into this in elastic kubernetes service environment which is a bit different and provides a bit more control about how we assume identity access management role Moving on to databases, uh, obviously the main thing uh, we can ask to consider is that backup backup job always can go wrong, uh, and this might affect connectivity non obviously. For example, during some of the, during one of the nightly backup jobs, according to AWS support, our RDS instance had unpredictable I/O burst, which led to suspension. And then backup job had to be rerun. So we saw not this picture in our logs, we just saw a couple of more events where RDS stated that we need to restore the database. Backup did not finish. We redid a backup, it went well, everything was fine. And even from Team City perspective, there was no access interruption. But um, behind the curtains, uh, application created a lot of pile, actually piled the connections. And then eventually connection pool or thread pool actually got exhausted and applications just stopped. So this should be taken into consideration as well. Generally, of course, it's a good idea to create backups from real replicas or even better from multi-AZ according to Amazon, if this is acceptable and applicable. And of course, database and instances and connections might must be fine-tuned. For example, database properties for SimCity server should have adequate timeout setup. And from the database service, um, instance size can be uh, selected differently based on max connections, for example. Um, so, moving on to general recommendations. Um, so apart from common container specific issues we had uh, for actually running a stateful applications, so we need to uh, share data, share volumes. Well, we think that Team State performs quite well hosted within the container. So it's a general recommendation to actually run TeamCity server in the container because TeamCity JetBrains com also runs as an ECS control Docker image, which is cool. Um, auto scaling group can help a lot with standard management procedures and lifecycle hooks can create a valuable link between plastic container service and auto scaling group in terms of infrastructure refresh. So when we need to 
drain instances, we can automatically update the auto scaling group. Of course, there are also things like capacity providers, which also help with infrastructure refresh. Um, also, uh, I've already mentioned, but mentioned once again, that API limits can be visualized and monitored, at least their error rate. And um, uh, CloudTrail can help here a lot. And we also think that in general, for quite a lot of issues or problems we had, um, for them, AWS probably already had a solution. So for example, Systems Manager does a good job providing remote access currently for us uh, via Session Manager. We don't have to use best in hosts and painfully rotate SSH keys. We just log in using our IAM fine grained policies and we have remote access. Um, it's also probably a good idea to use Cognito instead of firewalls because it integrates well with application load balancer so you can rather easily restrict access using your uh, identity provider, for example, without having to manage uh, IP addresses anymore. It's not always applicable, but probably it's a good thing to consider. And for example, we don't need to use self host to self host an SMTP server if we can use SES, Simple Email Service. And more than that, Simple Email Service plugin for Team City does even more. It can ban bounced emails. So, generally, it's a good idea to just uh, use this to send your emails from server. And uh, to conclude, conclude with the general recommendations and my presentation. Overall, I would like to mention that Team City already has a lot to offer out of the box for cloud integration. For example, we would like to highlight it once more because surprisingly there is a lot of uh, clients seemingly unaware of this. For example, the on-demand start of the EC2 based agents, spot instances also are supported or uh, build features to log into Docker registry, which can perform Docker login automatically, Docker login, Docker pull, Docker push, Docker tag, etc. And um, that also you can use as free as an artifact storage out of the box, which is rather cool um, in my opinion. Um, so I think that is that is it. I hope it was helpful. So. We probably can move on to Q and A. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Nikita. That was really helpful. And I, I want to reiterate one of the things Nikita mentioned. We do have a pretty wide array of out of the box functionality with cloud uh, cloud instances, whether you're using AWS, Azure, Google Cloud uh, today. Um, if you are running your build agents in cloud environments, you can offload the ability for Team City to spin up and spin down those agents. Uh, in Amazon, it's based off of an AMI or just a direct EC2 instance you create. Uh, and it really gives you a lot more flexibility as far as um, your license utilization, making sure that the licenses that you're paying for are uh, you know, being utilized uh, as, as much as possible. So uh, if you haven't looked at any of those capabilities, um, you, know, you don't need to move to Team City Cloud to utilize those capabilities. You can take advantage of them today. Um, we do have some questions in the chat. Uh, Nikita, I'll start off with uh, one of the more technical ones. In your architecture, you guys are using uh, ECS as opposed to EKS. Is there a reason for that? Uh, it, it is. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this more in the presentation. Um, yes, we're currently moving away from ECS to Kubernetes. And the primary um, decision behind this was um, that uh, we don't scale well with out of the box load balance integration. We have to uh, to manage load balancer, and yes, Amazon has just released the uh, application load balancer controller, which also can be used with EKS currently only. Um, and apart from that, we ran into a lot of throttling issues running uh, quite a big ECS cluster we have, and we think that. Mm, EKS provides a bit more 
freedom in terms of managing load balancers. For example, we use uh, self-managed ingress instead of using uh, application load balancer now. So, yeah, I think this this was the primary reason of us moving to EKS. Okay, great. Um, one more question for you, and this is more about the capabilities. And I'll add, we will be uh, releasing more information about, uh, I guess, the individual capabilities within Team City Cloud. Um, but uh, one of the questions is, does Team City Cloud uh, provide the same features as the on-premise traditional server version that most of uh, the folks on the call are probably using? Uh, is it the same UI? Do we expect any differences? Could you talk a little bit about uh, some of the differences uh, or some of the similarities between Team City and what will be available in Team City Cloud? Sure. Um, actually, uh, the main principle was when we started Team City Cloud uh, in 2019, the main principle was just to take the base on premise product and just enhance this functionality. So basically, we built Team City Cloud on top of the uh, regular Team City. We use, of course, we use the same code, we use the same UI. Um, so far, uh, there are no actual plans to have a different UI for Team City Cloud. Of course, from the um, from from the uh, client perspective, like we will provide um, a cabinet to to track usage of Team City Cloud. But in general, uh, there is a a parity between on-premise Team City and Team City Cloud. We don't want to differentiate them a lot. Okay, great. Yeah, and I mentioned this in the chat. As far as like functional differences, a lot of the administration capabilities in Team City Cloud are obviously going to be hidden since we're hosting uh, all of that infrastructure. Uh, some things like being able to install third-party plugins are, are also really only available on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, but by and large, we're trying to provide. Uh, the same experience. Team City Cloud, you will be able to use JetBrains provided agents, uh, or you can bring your own self hosted agents uh, to that environment. Uh, I also wanted to double down on one of the points from the kid's uh, last slide. It's, it, it doesn't relate directly to Team City Cloud, but I think it's quite relevant in, in the current circumstances. So, you could have mentioned there is a built in feature in Team City uh, that allows you to. Uh, add a Docker registry connection to your builds in your project. And uh, what that basically means is that uh, Team City will automatically uh, sign into Docker registry on your behalf uh, when it does any of the Docker related builds. Uh, and given the newest uh, Docker limitations on the number of uh, available pools, as you might know, uh, this is a very helpful feature. And we definitely like urge you to please do that for your builds, especially if you're using one of the uh, free Docker accounts, at least you will be not anonymous, so you'll get more pools out of uh, your for your Docker builds. All right. I uh, appreciate it, Nikita. Um, we'll uh, let you off the hook here. Um, we're going to introduce our next speaker. We're about three minutes over schedule, but we should be okay. Uh, I want to take the chance here to introduce uh, Marco. Uh, Marco, you should be hearing from a lot more over the next few months. Uh, he's our new developer advocate for Team City. Um, some of you have probably met or have seen video tutorials from Anton. He's still in JetBrains. He's working on some other projects now. Uh, so Marco is uh, our new developer advocate. He's going to take you through uh, the Kotlin DSL. Um, thanks, Marco. Take it away. Thank you, David. Uh, hi, all, and welcome to this talk called Team City and the Kotlin DSL, From Zero to Hero. And as David said, I'm Marco Bela. I'm the new developer advocate for Team City at JetBrains. And this talk is all about how to create your build configurations, your build pipelines in Team City with Kotlin code instead of using the UI. And we're not just going to cover the basics like how to get started with Kotlin DSL. We're also going to have a look at some of the more intermediate and advanced concepts. And I could basically spam you with abstract slides telling you how good it is to have a statically typed language like Kotlin uh, with uh, superb IDE support and IntelliJ IDE and whatnot, and how much makes sense to use it for your build configurations. But I'd rather have you see the Kotlin DSL live in action and then judge for yourself by the end after now 50 
of 55 minutes of live coding slash live configuration, um, if you like it or not. I think that's enough uh, as a start. And uh, you know enough, we can get started, right? Now, what I did is I prepared for this talk a small sample application. It's a to-do list application. It's written in Java with the Spring Boot Framework. And it actually doesn't matter too much what the application itself is doing. What matters more is the project structure for our build chain later on. So we're going to have a quick look at the project setup. And as you can see, I have the project checked out. It's called a new to-do list. It has a POM XML file, so it's a Maven project. And then you see the default Maven directory layout, source main Java, and resources with the Java classes and HTML templates that make up the application. And then a bit more interesting, we have a test folder with two packages, an integration package and a unit package containing, well, integration and unit tests, respectively. Uh, more specifically, there's one slow web service test, which takes about five to 10 seconds to run because it connects an external web service. And there's a unit test, which is pretty instantaneous. And it's good to know about these two tests for our build pipeline that we're going to build in a second. But before we start writing Kotlin code, I actually want to go through setting up a build pipeline for this project in TeamCity with the UI first, so we're all on the same page with the same terminology and whatnot. So what I have is I have my Team City server, and I'll just, it's completely empty at the moment. I'll just start by creating a new project from scratch, completely from scratch. I'm gonna paste in my repository URL. What you can actually do, now it's on GitHub, Marco Bila JetBrains, a new to-do list. You can fork and clone the repository and do exactly the same steps I'm doing here for this presentation. And then what you want to do is you want to give Team City right access to your repository. Why? Because when you enable Kotlin code later on, Team City needs to commit to your repository from time to time, hence you need write access. And I'll tell you when that is uh, in a second. So I'm just going to paste in my access token here. Um, click proceed. It's going to take me a second. Team City is trying to connect to GitHub, right? And then I can see, well, the connection was successful. The project name could be a new to-do list for now with one build configuration called build. I'm just going to go with the defaults. That's all fine and good. And then Team City does its magic. It scans the VCS repository. It finds a POM XML file and says, well, if you have a POM XML file, I recommend you to have a build step called Maven, executing the goals clean test, essentially running the two tests you saw just a minute ago. And I'm, again, I'm going to go with the defaults for now. Right, and we have that build step. Now, I can already trigger build, so I'm just going to click Run here. And it brings me to the overview page. Team City, the build agent is running. It's starting the build. While that is happening, I just want to go back to my configuration page. I'm just, as I mentioned before, want to quickly go through the terminology. We're here on the project level, a new to-do list inside the build build configuration. We just have one uh, configuration, which is called build. And here on the left, you can see you have version control settings pointing to the GitHub repository, Marco Bila JetBrains, a new to-do list, which is by default pulled every 60 seconds. For this demonstration here, I put it down the checking interval to five seconds, um, but there's polling involved. And then you have a corresponding VCS trigger with a branch filter set to star, which means that every commit you make to any branch in your repository uh, will trigger a build. So we have version control settings, the triggers. And last but not least, we have our build step, our Maven build step, which runs clean test. Again, it just runs those two tests we saw earlier. And now when I go to the project overview page, 
that was already enough. So I can see my build worked, test pass two, just as I expected it to be. I can even have a look. So the web service test here says it took me five seconds, right? And the syntax check unit test took me less than one millisecond. Right. Now we have that as a starting point. We have a team, a very simple project configured in Team City. Now the question is, how do we turn that project configuration that we just did into Kotlin code? And again, you're not going to start out by writing Kotlin code immediately. Rather, you're going through the UI at the very beginning, at least. So what you can do is, again, go to make sure to go to the project level now, not inside the build configuration, but on the project level. And you'll find a link here, which is called version settings. Why do, do we need to go to version settings? Because your Kotlin code is also going to live in a VCS route. So in, in this case, in my GitHub repository, it's being versioned. Hence, you need to enable version settings. And you have some options here simply saying, well, please enable synchronization. And then Team City prompts you to choose a VCS route. I'm going to choose my A new to-do list repository, meaning my Kotlin code is going to live in the same repository. It could also live in a completely separate repository. And we're going to have a look at that at the end of this talk, actually. So I'm just going to go with that. I have a couple of options here. And usually what I want to do is whenever a build starts, it should use the latest settings from the VCS from my checked in Kotlin code. So I'm going to go with that. And you could use the upper options if, for example, your Kotlin code was broken and you wanted to override these settings from the Team City server UI. But as a default, just go with the VCS settings. And then down here, you can see you have two different settings formats. An XML was the default. You want to choose Kotlin. And just a quick note, the Kotlin code you're writing actually generates those XML files behind the scenes for you, right? And um, you have Kotlin code. And I think before Team City Server 2018, there was a different way of writing these Kotlin scripts, and they are called non portable. And if you're writing Kotlin scripts for new Team City Server versions, you always want to go with these portable DSL scripts. Right. A lot of talking. You can finally hit apply. And then you'll see a new section pop up down here the current status. Now, Team City is going through your build configuration, the one we just created, a new to-do list with that one build step, running through it, and then actually creating Kotlin code and committing the Kotlin code to your repository. So you can see that message here, successfully committed revision. Right. Let's have a look at what Team City actually committed, which means I'm going back to my ID. I'm just doing a pull. It takes a second to finish. And then I get a message saying two files updated in one commit. I have a new Team City folder up here in my project, which has two files, a POM XML file and a settings KTS file. <clears throat> Inside my settings KTS file, there's my Kotlin code. And the POM XML file means this folder is also a Maven project. But it is not related to your A new to-do list project in any way. It's a completely separate Maven project, which means you actually need to add it as Maven project. Otherwise, IntelliJ IDEA will not pick it up automatically, right? So this is just one tiny thing to keep in mind. What you also can do while you're at it, I like to download sources and documentation later on so I can actually go through the Kotlin DSL and have source code available documentation, right? But you want to make sure to add the POM XML file as a Maven project. You can see IntelliJ is working, downloading dependencies. And after a while, these icons will change. And you will see that IntelliJ now recognizes the thing right now as a module, which means you get auto completion. And that's what you want inside your POM XML file, also inside your Kotlin file. The POM XML file doesn't matter too much for now. Let's have a look at the settings KTS file, the Kotlin code for your project on the Team City server. 
Now at the top, you have a version flag saying what version uh, generated that Kotlin um, uh, script file, 2020.1, doesn't matter too much for now. But up next, you can see I have a project block. Inside the project block, I call a method calling build type, and I'm referencing a singleton object down here called build. Now, what's a build type? Um, essentially, build type in Kotlin DSL is the same thing as a build configuration in the UI. So it's just two different names, one for the Kotlin DSL build type uh, and build, co build configuration in the UI. So I'm essentially saying my project has one build type slash build configuration referencing the object build. And when you look at the build object, you can, you'll see you have a name flag build. That's what you see in the UI. You have your VCS root that we just had a look at with a shorthand set to DSL context settings root, which means the uh, VCS root for your project, for your A new to-do list project is the same as the one where your settings KTS file lives in. So you don't have to specify the URL manually. Then you have a step, one Maven step. We have that already, Maven goals, clean test. Simply running the tests, runner arguments, uh, Maven specific runner arguments, which basically Maven by default stops whenever it finds the first um, failed test. And in a CI system, you just wanna you know collect statistics of all the failed tests, so you have that flag here, right? Uh, Maven step. And then last but not least, we have a default VCS trigger, which simply means every commit to every branch uh, will result in a build. And that is what a very simple Kotlin file looks like describing your project on the Team City server. Now we have that file. Let's actually try it out. What happens if we make a very simple change? And if instead of calling Maven Clean Test down here, we just say, well, I want to call Maven Clean Package. And then we're just going to go uh, commit and push this change. And we're going to have a look at what happens on the Team City server side now. So I just committed, the push succeeded. Let's go back to the Team City server. Now, as mentioned before, I decreased the, the polling interval to five seconds so we can actually see stuff faster here. Otherwise, we'd have to wait 60 seconds for something to happen. But down here, you always see the current status. So running DSL means Team City already fetched the latest Kotlin script version. It's running through the DSL through the Kotlin code, generating those XML files. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to keep that tab open here, right? And uh, I'm just quickly going to open up another tab with um, the configuration open. So I can switch easily between these two. Again, I'm in the a new to-do list build configuration, build step maven. And as you can see down here already, Team City updated itself. The goal now doesn't say clean test anymore. The goal says clean package. So after the polling, after the latest polling, Team City saw, well, we changed something in the Kotlin script file and it updated itself. That was rather simple and uh, quite cool, but it was a very simple change. So what we did is we just added, uh, sorry, modified a Maven goal here from an existing block. What happens if you want to add, say, new build features? Everything that you can basically do in the UI, you can also do in the Kotlin script, but, but where would you start? And you might be thinking, well, it's Kotlin, and I have auto-completion going on in my IDE, so I can just go inside the build type here, for example, wait a second, and then have like a pause flag, template, a create method, an ID method and whatnot. I could step inside my VCS block and I'd, I'd find a branch filter. And I could, as I mentioned before, you can have the documentation up for all these uh, uh, variables, defines a branch filter to be used for branches coming from snapshot dependencies, for example. You could go inside your Maven build step. Here you'll even find options for Docker pull, Docker image platform, Docker image, POM location, right? But at the beginning, 
When you're not used to writing your Kotlin code, that's not how you start out, just hitting autocomplete and then go through the documentation, hope that everything is going to be fine. Rather, there's an easier, simpler way to, well, ease you into writing this Kotlin code. And again, it starts with the UI, actually. So let's go back. And imagine you want, let's edit that build step again. And you have that dialog window popping up. You have a ton of different options. So for example, you could say, well, this build step should have a custom step name. Let's call the build step Marco step. You want to maybe call Maven clean test again. For whatever reason, you want to set the Maven version to 3.4.354, uh, right? You also set the JDK version to JDK 14. And if you wanted to, you could also uh, specify a Docker container image here, right? Now, what would these options look like in Kotlin code? That is the big question. And as you can see, Team City here at the bottom says, the changes are not yet saved, click save. But I don't want to click save for now. Rather, I want to scroll up again. And on the left, you find a button which is called View DSL. Click this button. And what you'll see is that a dynamic view of your settings KTS file opens up. Here is your build object, the one you just saw in the IDE, with your name, with, with your VCS root, with your Maven step. And then with all the options that you just cl clicked and selected in the UI as Kotlin code. So you can just select this block here, the Maven block, copy and paste it, do not click save, and then go back to your ID and just override whatever there is at the moment. That's how you would set Maven version. You would call a method bundle three underscore five, JDK home and whatnot. That's how the Kotlin code would look like. Now, that was for an existing Maven step. Can we do the same thing for completely new blocks as well? Yes, we can. So again, when you go back, for example, think about, actually, let's change one existing block before that as well. Let's change the VCS trigger. Here you can see you have the branch filter set to star. And when you click edit, then you'll have a new dialog window pop up. And you cannot click that view DSL button here on the left anymore. I'll show you how to do it in a second. But first, let's click some random options. The options themselves don't matter too much for uh, at the moment. It's just some random options. So I'm going to go with a quiet period of 30 seconds, trigger build on each check-in, right? And then you'll find on the dialog window, you'll find a view DSL button. You click that. And then again, you get the Kotlin code corresponding to your options. Do not click Save anywhere in that process. Just go and view the DSL. Now we're going to copy that. And you can see you're in the triggers, on the triggers page with your VCS uh, code. Now when you go back, where do you copy and paste your code to? You could put it here to the VCS root, but you know you're on the triggers page. You have to actually put it inside the triggers block here. So just a quick copy and paste, right? You get a compile error because there's an import missing. So let's import. And that's a tiny side note that the Kotlin DSL comes in many different versions, which don't necessarily correspond to the, to the Team City server version. And uh, 2019 underscore two here is the latest Kotlin code version. So you're just going to go with that. The code compiles and everything is fine again. Now let's add a completely new block. Actually, let's add a build feature, right? So for example, let's say you want to add a build feature saying free disk space. You always want to have six gigabytes of free disk space before you run a build and fail the build if you don't have that disk space. Again, do not click save, just click view DSL. Copy to clipboard, you'll see free disk space, required space equals six gigabytes, failed build equals true, right? You go back, remember you're under the build features page. So inside here, you just kind of paste it anywhere, but 
the features block. Right? Make sure you get the import right again. And that's it. So the gist is, at the beginning, when you start out with the Kotlin DSL, you're very unlikely to just go inside your settings KTS file and start writing Kotlin code. What you'd rather do is go to your Team City UI, change the settings, do not click Save, and then just copy and paste them back into your settings KTS file. It's going to take a while. You can start out with your current project to get used to it. And after a while, after a couple of weeks, once you actually feel comfortable with all the settings and what you can specify in Kotlin code, then you would transition to writing uh, Kotlin code straight, straight Kotlin code. Keep that in mind. Now, I put in all this Kotlin code. And actually, for what I want to show you next, um, I'm just going to quickly revert it. I'm just going to roll back because I don't want my build features and my VCS trigger and whatever to be custom. I just want to have my simple build object again with uh, the clean package goal. right? And we saw what happens when you now commit something. Then Team City, the server, picks it up, uh, changes the configuration. The next question is, what happens if you change a Kotlin script file here, but you also make changes in the Team City UI, right? So for that, let's actually go back and maybe open up the build, the Maven build step again. And you can see on every page, literally it says, well, the configuration is now stored in Kotlin DSL. Consider changing the settings in the script instead of the user interface. Let's see what happens when we change stuff in the user interface. So for now, well, let's say we want to switch the goal back to clean test. And now, instead of just hitting view DSL here on the left, I want you to click Save and go with the changes are not yet saved. Yes, let's save them. Right. So the build settings were updated. The goal is now clean test. So that seemed to work from the UI perspective. And when I go to my version settings, then I can see that Team City is actually doing something. And again, it successfully committed something to my repository. Let's see what that is. Now I'm back in my project. I'm doing a pull. And I got a file updated in one commit. I'm going to open that up here. As you can see, the goal is now Maven clean test. And I have a commit here. I'll just make that bigger, where it basically shows Team City was smart enough to understand, well, if you just want to change the goal from Maven clean package to Maven clean test, I can do that for you in the Kotlin code. That's pretty easy. So I'm just going to commit that change to your repo. That is quite nice. But that was a very simple change. Now, what happens if we uh, throw off Team City, and for whatever reason, we introduce a variable, for example? So we're going to have my Maven goal in here. And this is going to be clean test. That's set to my Maven goal. I'm just going to commit and push that. And let's find out if Team City is smart enough to understand that variable. And that now it needs to change the my Maven goal variable instead of the goal. So we're going back. We can see the latest status. So it's going to take, right? So Team City is now again fetching the VCS config. It's running the Kotlin uh, DSL. While it does that, while it applies the changes, I'm already going to go to edit here, Maven clean test. I'm going to go set it back to clean package. Very confusing. I'm basically just switching back and forth between package and test here. And I'm going to click Save. Build settings were updated. When I go to the version settings, again, I can see that Team City is doing something. It's running through my project. And hopefully, well, I see again that something was committed to my repository. Let's find out what that something was. So back in my project, I'm just doing a pull. And let's see what happens. 
No, the goal is still set to clean test here. But what you can see is on the left here, I got a new folder. I got a patches folder. There's one file inside, a patch for whatever the build configuration is called. It's called build here. So I get a, get a build Kotlin script file. And this is not like a Git patch, which you can automatically merge. Rather, it's a Kotlin file you manually have to go through if you want to apply it. So in this case, you can see that Team City expects there to be a Maven step with the goals clean test and some runner arguments. And then the patch down here says the goal should now, everything else should stay the same, but the goal should be now be clean package. And now you as a developer have to be smart enough to basically copy this or understand what uh, is meant by th this line. Go back into your settings KTS file. Now know well, I need to change it back to a uh, clean package here, right? Like so. Or rather, let's get rid of the variable again because it doesn't make too much sense apart from demonstrating the patching concept, right? And then you would, after finally applying your patch, you would delete your patch file again. Delete that, uh, commit and push, and now the patch is applied. But that is a manual concept. Because Team City isn't smart enough, it's not an AI to understand, to fully parse your Kotlin script file and know that it now has to change the, uh, the variable. Right. So for simple changes, Team City is smart enough. For more complex changes, Team City cannot do much but generate these patches. Right. So that is actually the basics of how you would get started with the Kotlin DSL. So you would enable the uh, version settings in Kotlin format. Team City would generate this skeleton file for you. You can play with the skeleton file yourself. Rather, you would probably uh, use the view DSL button at the beginning, right? And um, try to make the changes through the Kotlin script file. But if you make changes through the UI, uh, then you will get these commits from Team City. Simple changes will be directly applied. Otherwise, you'll get a patch. And that is enough to go to the next part of the of the of this live uh, live coding session which is about building a more realistic build pipeline because so far the only thing we had is we have one build configuration calling clean package now with our a new to do list project it's a bit artificial what we are about to do but just imagine you're in a real world project where you maybe have a compile step slash build configuration in team city speak and then you have, because your tests are so slow and you have many of them, you might have UI tests and you might have uh, integration tests and whatnot. You want to have some tests running in parallel after your compile step. And then at the end, you have a package step where you will package up your Java file, WAR file, or operating system executables and whatnot. So it's going to be a tiny build chain that runs sequentially, but also has some parallel step uh, steps inside. And we're going to start with that by just saying, well, um, yeah, the build build type just does a Maven clean compile for now. And then at the moment, I don't want you to uh, use best practices. I want you to repeat. Well, do you repeat yourself? I want myself to repeat myself. Um, just copy and pasting code. Not the best way to do it, but for now, it's perfectly fine. So I just want to have another build configuration, which is called package. If we think about the first build step and the last build step, right? So I'm just going to go with package here. It calls Maven clean package. And then Maven specifically, uh, clean package also runs tests. We don't want that. So we're going to use the flag skip tests. So it only packages up the final uh, jar file for our Spring Boot application. So we have these two build types. And then you would register them, uh, the package build type, like so, with the project. Now you have two build types. You have two build types, but they are not yet a build chain. And in Team City speak, you know that to have a build chain, you basically need dependencies, or more specifically, snapshot dependencies between build types. 
package needs a dependency on build. And in the UI, you would open up the dependencies page and then select the um, build snapshot dependency. So you could do the same thing in Kotlin code by just saying, well, I have one snapshot dependency referencing my build object up there. But then again, we're in Kotlin code. It's a programming language, a full-blown programming language. Isn't there a better way than having these specific snapshot dependencies, especially if we're thinking of adding more and more dependencies to our project? And yes, there is a better way. So I'm just going to comment out the dependencies block. Go up to my project. And there's another method you can call in the project, which is called sequential. And the only thing the sequential sequentials method does is whatever build types you have in here, specified in here, they will have dependencies on each other. So the first build type won't have a dependency because there's no preceding build type, but package will have a dependency on build. And that's a very simple build chain. All you need to do. Now, before we commit this code, let's have a quick double check if everything is okay. We have our build types. Um, dependency specified. Now, in a build chain in Team City, only the last part of the build chain needs a VCS trigger, so I can remove that here, right? But everything else looks perfectly fine. Let me just commit and push that code and see what happens once Team City sees that new Kotlin script file. Right, that worked. Let's go back. I can see I now need to wait. Team City was smart enough, or fast enough rather. It fetched a configuration. It's already running the DSL, right? It's going to take a second, whatnot. And once this is done here, I'm going to open up the overview page. Right, the changes have been applied. So I'm just going to go to the overview page. Let's see what happens. I can already see here that my project, a new to-do list, has on the left has these two build types now. And when I open up the build chains tab, which takes a second, I can see I have a build chain. So build is firing up, and afterwards it feeds into package. That's exactly what we wanted. Now, this is already quite cool. So we have our compile step, we have our package step. But I talked about earlier, a bit earlier, about these parallel test steps. And remember, we have these two tests. We have our slow web service test. We have our syntax checker unit test. Let's make them run in parallel and put them into that build chain. Again, a bit artificial, but it will demonstrate quite nicely how you would run these parallel tests. So again, let's copy and paste and duplicate some code. This is going to be the fastest build type. It's going to be called fastest in the UI as well. We're going to run Maven clean test again. And in Maven, there's a flag saying, I only want to run uh, classes that end with test inside of a unit package. Right. That's a flag which will run our unit test. And then I'm just going to copy and paste it again. Let's call it slow test now. Slow test. The only difference is that you now need to execute tests from the integration package. But that's all you need to do. Which means I need to go back up here and I have my, I have to register my fast test build type and my slow test build type with the project. And I also have to put them inside of the build chain. Now, what would happen is you have your uh, build build type, then you have fast test running afterwards, slow test running afterwards, package running afterwards, because it's all sequential dependencies. So package depends on slow test, slow test depends on fast test, fast test depends on build. We want to run these two in parallel. And thankfully, there's a block called parallel, which you can call. And you just copy and paste, or cut and paste, rather, your build types inside here. Now, what happens is build type still has no dependencies. 
But everything inside, every build type inside the parallel block has a dependency on build. Package has a dependency on everything inside the parallels block. And these two don't have a dependency on each other. They will just run in parallel. That's all you need to do. So just quickly double checking again, we have our faster slow test, faster slow test defined here, faster slow test, just calling Maven clean test. This should hopefully work. Again, let's commit and push the changes. And then wait our five to 10 seconds, whatnot. So the push just uh, succeeded. Going back here to my browser, let's have a look at the status section. So, so this version settings tab here uh, is basically a new, new, new friend because you always see the current status, what's happening, that it just fetched my Kotlin script file, is it running the Kotlin script file, what is going on with my, everything you'll find on the version settings page, right? So I'm just gonna go here, I'm just gonna refresh and see what you can actually already see. Well, I have um, four build types here. Now, what is a bit unfortunate is that the build ran while my configuration was still uh, actually applying. This is a small bug and it shouldn't look like this. Rather, you should have a real nice build pipeline. So we have to wait uh, a second for it to run actually. And I'm just gonna rerun it, another run. And then hopefully in the overview, we see a nice little build chain. Let me just check. Our build chain here, right? So this is what it actually should look like. Uh, if the build and the version settings aren't applied at the, exactly the same second. So we have our build, faster slow test running in parallel and our package build configuration, right? If you only have one build agent, what happens is this build chain will run sequentially. If you have two build agents, it's gonna take a while, but then still it will run in parallel. And last but not least, you have your build build configuration. Right, I'm gonna wait a bit, um, go back to the code till this here has finished, talk a bit more about the code, and then we're gonna have a look at that build chain in a second again. Because up till now, what I said is, I just want to basically duplicate my code. So we simply took um, the build object, copy and pasted it four different times, just renamed a couple of settings like the name, the Maven goals, and the runner argument slightly. But everything else is pretty much the same. Now, isn't there like a better way of structuring the whole thing? And yes, there actually is a better way. You have a programming language, you can do what you want. Now, having these four objects that look the same, you might think, well, then let's introduce a class and call the class Maven, for example and then cut and paste everything from inside here into uh, the Maven class, right? And so the name differs, the goal differs, and the runner arguments differ, which might lead to you having a name constructor argument, a goals constructor argument, and also runner args constructor argument. Let's give it a default value of null so you don't always have to specify these runner arguments. And then inside here, you'll say that, well, the name should be the name. This goals should be goals. And this runner arguments should be runner arguments, like so. And now up here, you wouldn't specify the build object you would rather go and say, well, have a new object, a Maven object, inline, so to speak. And the only thing it does is, let's call Maven clean compile, which means you can get rid of the build object for now. That works. Tiny problem is the compile error down here because we would now need to have a reference to that Maven object up here. And I'm gonna show you a better way, instead of extracting the variable for now, I'm just gonna leave in the compile error and we're gonna fix it in a couple of minutes. So for now, we replace the build build type with this Maven object up here. Let's replace package, the package build type. 
because a package is really just Maven clean package. And here we can add the skip test parameter, the runner arguments, which means I can go and delete my package object. Just note that there's the VCS trigger inside and we have to take care of the VCS trigger uh, in a second as well. But for now, let's delete the object. Going up again, I have my fast test. So I'm going to call Maven clean test here. Now this time I'm just going to quickly cut and paste the runner arguments. So like so. And then last but not least, I have my slow test where only the package differs. Right. These are the four build types, which means I can now go about deleting the fast test and the slow test object as well. So all I'm left with is my four definitions up here. I have my Maven class, and that's it. A lot less code, a lot less duplication. The only problem is I still need to define dependencies inside my sequentials block down here. And wouldn't it be cool if you could just go, well, it should ideally just be like this. So you're going to just take that, like so. Have that, which would be nice. But whatever you put inside the sequentials block, unfortunately, doesn't register with the project. So you still need to do that manually. And there's a tiny workaround where you can do is you can ask uh, for the build types, all the build types in the sequentials block and then just have a good old for each loop calling the uh, build type method with the iterator. For every build type inside here, you call the build type method on the project and thus register the build type with the project, right? And this for loop replaces these four manual lines you uh, just saw earlier. Now, there's one last thing we need to do is, I said the last build type of a build chain also needs a trigger. So we're just going to put our VCS trigger block to whatever the last build type in this chain is here. Right. Now, this code replaces all the code duplication that we just saw earlier. Let's commit and push and see what happens if this actually works or if I missed something. Right, so I can see the push succeeded. I'm just gonna go back. I'm gonna go to the versions set. So actually from earlier, the build chain ran, right? Everything is green, but I just want to quickly go to the version settings page again. So Team City is fetching my latest Kotlin file. It's running the DSL. Now let's see if it has any complaints with my Kotlin code. Gonna take a second again, quick breather. Right. And this is just to show you that you would also see you would also see the error message on the project project's overview page. But here you see, well, I failed to apply the changes from your latest revision. It seems to me that there's well three build types with the ID a new to do list underscore maven. And now Team City says, well, it's already used in the build type. So, right, I couldn't apply your settings KTS file. Why is that? When you go back, every build type in Team City needs a unique ID. And if you're starting up with Kotlin code, you're going to have the project ID, so a new to do list underscore, and then the class name from the build of the build type. The class name is called Maven, and I'm instantiating four Maven objects up here. So I'm going to end up with a new to-do list underscore Maven, a new to-do list underscore Maven, and so on and so forth, which is three times too much. And the workaround, but this is something people stumble upon is, once they start refactoring their build scripts is, you have to give every build type a unique ID. And you can do that as a quick workaround by saying that, well, I want to take the name, whatever the name that is passed in, like build, faster, slow, test, package. And then I'm going to call the method 
to external ID on it, which sanitizes the value, gets rid of the white spaces and whatnot, so that it's a unique, valid uh, Team City ID. So I'm just going to commit and push this change again, this time just with the ID set. Right, the push succeeded. Again, we can uh, wait a couple of seconds till Team City detects the change. It's going to take us five seconds at least, the polling interval. And then Team City should fetch, as it does here, the latest revision. It's already running the latest DSL. Nice. And fingers crossed, I shouldn't get any error messages anymore. Rather, I should be greeted with, I was able to successfully apply all these changes. Right? And I actually, that's what I get. The changes were applied to the project. So I can go back to my overview page. Right? This, the build being read was from early on. This was when uh, my build was still uh, broken. The Kotlin code was broken. So you get that fail to load build settings from VCS. But now you can see a new build is already running. And once we come back here, uh, you'll see that everything is green again. So everything is working as expected, just with a lot less code. Now, while the build is running and while everything is turning green again, what I want to do is just quickly talk some philosophy. What you saw with the Kotlin code is you have a full-blown programming, programming language. You have a million project, so you can actually include external libraries. You could also put files in here, like a JSON file, and read in a JSON file and create your build types dynamically from the JSON file. You cannot do network calls, so you cannot uh, do like REST service calls uh, to ask other servers uh, because the Kotlin code is running in a sandbox. This might change in the future. I'm not 100% sure. But apart from that, you can do <clears throat> anything you want in these Kotlin files. And there's always a balance you have to keep between adding more custom layers on top of the default Kotlin code because your colleagues, co-workers might not understand what's going on. And um, just keep that in mind. The more code you add, the more custom code you add, the, the harder it gets for you, potentially harder it gets for your colleagues to understand what's going on. But after a while, you should find the right balance inside your company, inside your teams, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Right. Now let's go back. Hopefully, this should now look a bit greener, right? So you can see uh, the build was successful. There was one pass, uh, fast test passed, uh, slow test passed, package was passed. If you want to see it as a build chain again, you can have the build chain overview. Everything is green. The tests ran. And this, as I mentioned before, the red build here was when our settings Kotlin uh, code was broken. Right. So to sum up, we had our build chain, very simple build chain. We just build at the beginning. Then we have packaged sequential build chain with the dependency specified with the sequentials block. And then later on, we added fast test, slow test running in parallel in our sequentials block. And then we, we did that by duplication uh, at the beginning. And then we refactored everything into more idiomatic Kotlin code, so to speak. Now I want to take these concepts one step further even. What I want to do is imagine, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we have a settings KTS file and it could live anywhere. It doesn't have to be in the same repository as my A new to-do list uh, project. It could be in any repository, and I want to use that settings KTS file as a template for all of the projects in my company. Because I might only have Maven projects, they always look the same. They always have these four steps, build, fast test, slow test, package, and whatever. So let's have some, would it be nice to have kind of a templating ability? And the only thing that differs between these different projects is, in the end, the Git repository URL. And we can actually do that with the advanced concept of context parameters. Let me show you how that works. So at the moment, 
we have our VCS route specified here. The shorthand I mentioned at the beginning, always the same repository as the project. Now, let's have a um, custom VCS route. Right, make sure to pick the right one, the latest one. And I know that for a VCS route, I need a name in Team City, I need a URL, and I need to specify a branch. It could be Ref's Heads main for now. And then I would, instead of referencing the shorthand, I would just reference the my VCS route here inside my Maven build type. And also I need to register uh, the VCS route with the project because it does it automatically for the shorthand, but not for a custom VCS route. So I have to call the VCS route method. Now, the only thing between all these projects in my company that differs is name and URL. So we need to have some sort of a parameter in here, and that's what where these context parameters come into play. You can simply go DSL context, get parameter, VCS name. Let's call it VCS name, any name you want. And for the URL, you could do VCS URL. And even for the branch, actually, let's say VCS branch, right? And let's use refs heads main as a default. Let's commit that. Commit and push. Like so. So the only thing we did is we introduced a new VCS route with a couple of context parameters, right? The question is, where do we add these context parameters now? And what I want to do is, not even as a joke, actually, I want to quickly do something before we continue. I'm actually a bit fed up with my project. I just want to delete the whole project. Let's just go click action OK. Let's just delete the whole thing. So what now happened is the project is deleted. And on my overview page, you won't see any projects anymore. It's all gone. Let's try and recreate the project. So we're going to start out, forget everything, not everything you just saw. Um, we're going to start with, by creating a new project. And again, I'm pasting in my repository URL. And this now should be the repository URL of your settings KTS file. It still lives inside the ANU to-do list repository. But just imagine for a second, it didn't. It lived in a completely different repository because I cannot show that or split up the repos uh, for this talk so quickly. So this is the repo with your settings KTS file. Again, make sure to give it uh, right access, Marco Bila JetBrains. Uh, paste in the token and click Proceed. And now let's see what happens. Team City says, well, I found a settings KTS file. What do you want me to do? Should I import the settings once? So just run the Kotlin code once, that's it. Should I import the settings code and also enable synchronization? So whenever I make changes to my Kotlin code, then Team City updates itself. Yes, I want to do that. I'm just going to go with the project name, a new to-do list, which is fine. I'm just going to hit proceed now. Let's see what now happens. It's going to take a second. Exciting. Team City is now running through your Kotlin code, checking out if there's something it might not understand. And it actually does. It says, Team City says, well, I require the following context parameters. You need to set a VCS name. So you could just say my repo. And I need to have a VCS URL for your project, which is the same URL now, but in real life, it will be the project's URL. So I'm just going to go with a new to-do list now. I don't have to specify the branch because it has a default value. So I'm just going to hit proceed. Now Team City is happy enough. It has the context parameters. It will be able to uh, run your Kotlin script file and apply the changes. And if everything works correctly, we should be greeted with our old build pipeline again, with our build chain. Let's see. So the project settings have been successfully loaded. 
And as you can see, our project is back again, a new to-do list. You have the four build types. No build is running at the moment, but I could trigger build at any point in time, right? The build queue is running. That's as simple as it was really. Now, a tiny thing, if you want to edit your project and you go to your version settings page, remember I mentioned that 20 times already in this talk, you'll also find by default, you're on the configuration tab here, where you have that uh, current status section, where you see what TeamCity is doing with your settings KTS file. There's also a context parameters tab where you can at any time change uh, the parameters you just set. So my repo, for example, the VCS URL, um, you could also add the VCS branch, change the branch and whatnot, delete the parameter, everything you wanted to do, you'll find here under the version settings page, right? That is in terms of advanced concepts, Kotlin DSL wise already enough. I don't have enough time to go into unit testing um, our script here because unit testing is also something you can do you, with your Kotlin code. You just add JUnit, you can start write unit tests. Um, we'll add a couple of videos in a couple of weeks which will cover unit testing. But for now, this is pretty much all I wanted to show you. Just doing a quick recap of what happened in this talk. Let me just go to logout HTML in my JetBrains to do uh, list application. So what we did is we started at the very beginning, we had the basic setup. So we had a very simple Maven project and created through the Team City UI a uh, build configuration, right? We turned that into Kotlin code by enabling version settings. And then we noticed that well, instead of writing Kotlin code from the start, you would rather go with the view DSL button and copy back and forth between the UI and your Kotlin code. We also saw what happened when you make changes, complex changes to your script file, but still make changes in the UI, then Team City will generate patches. And then we took it one step further, looking at build chains, very simple sequential build chain, uh, which just build package and then build and parallel test steps in between and a package build configuration at the end. We refactored the whole thing because at the beginning we did a lot of code duplication and then we had this one Maven class at the end. And we even took it one step further at the very end, uh, introducing context parameters in a way that you can use the settings KTS file as a template for many different projects. If that wasn't enough, you will also have further reading to do there's the documentation, the Kotlin diesel documentation on our website. There's also a blog series by from our previous developer advocate, Configuration as Code, a six part series, a great series on how to get started with um, Kotlin code in Team City. And we'll paste these links also in the chat in a second, I think. But other than that, that was all I wanted to show you. I hope you learned something from the talk. And uh, that's it uh, from me for now. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Marco. Um, really helpful talk, and uh, we're seeing, I'm seeing a lot of our Team City customers, and really across the CI spectrum, whether you're using Team City or uh, one of our competitors' tools, customers are moving towards configuration as code. So if it's not something you've encountered yet in your own environments, I expect this is something you're going to encounter uh, in the next one year, two years, um, as more organizations look to take advantage of. Um, a lot of the functionality that uh, versioning your configuration settings can offer. Um, we'll uh, ask a couple questions and then we'll uh, get moving on with our next talk. Marco, could you speak, I guess, a little bit generally, keeping on that same point to uh, why some customers are moving towards configuration as code and some of the, the benefits uh, it offers? Right. I mean, it's just... You have everything traceable in one repository. You can see who changed what. You can always roll back to uh, a specific set of code, basically. You can, um, if you're using Kotlin or any other programming language, uh, for that matter, to write your configuration, you have all these refactoring possibilities. What we did is not just like work well, with XML or YAML, uh, the YAML hell. We have very let's say basic capabilities of um, creating complex build pipelines, for example, uh, with code, 
it's pretty much up for you to decide what you want to do, how you want to do it. And it's just really powerful. So I think that combination between having uh, Kotlin code, the power of Kotlin, and then have a, have, having everything in a central repository, traceable version at all times, uh, it's it's a very good combination that you might want to check out for your, for your build systems. Yep. Yeah, completely agree. Um, there are also a number of questions in the chat about being able to uh, lock down the, the user interface. So um, I'll address a couple of those questions. Um, right now, you can set your Team City server into a read-only mode uh, so that you can't make configuration changes uh, to your build config. So that's one way to prevent users, at least from going into the UI um, and modifying changes. Uh, we will introduce some more functionality in some of the 2021 releases um, that will further help you lock down your Team City instance if you want to move to a environment where all of your configurations are defined as code. Um, the last thing is you can manage the roles, uh, basic roles in Team City, so you can prevent users from um, accessing uh, the build configurations or being able to edit there. Um, Let's see, let's see. Uh, one of the questions in the chat, how is it recommended to test your DSL changes in Team City? And I know we addressed this in the chat as well. Um, so Marco, you mentioned unit tests. Could you talk a little bit about uh, some of the basic capabilities there? Right, so uh, basically what you, what you can do is, uh, as I mentioned, you can add any library you want, your JUnit, uh, JUnit for example, test and G, whatever. Uh, start writing unit tests and um, testing configuration so that every, for example, build type has a specific requirement on a specific Java agent version that you that your project has a uh, Maven build step and whatever you basically wanted to test. And what makes sense then actually is to run those unit tests as part of your build chain as a very first step. So you could essentially just say you have one build configuration at the very beginning of your build chain running through these unit tests. So you always are sure that well, you have uh, the, the, the chain in an expected state, your build configuration in an expected state. That's how we would approach it. But then again, it takes a couple of minutes to show it. Um, a bit too much, too many minutes for uh, this talk. But uh, we're going to publish some material. And also in the blog series I mentioned, you will find a unit testing example you can try out yourself. Yeah, great, excellent. And this is an area we've identified internally as um, a topic a lot of people want to learn more about. So um, if you're uh, asking where certain documentation is, you know, we really do appreciate that feedback. Uh, sometimes the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So uh, make sure you're tweeting at us on our U track, uh, yelling at our uh, our great support engineers that uh, this is the type of content you want, and we'll uh, we'll do our best to put it out there for it. Um, all right, Marco, I think that's all I'm going to ask of you today. Uh, we're certainly going to ask plenty more of you uh, over the, the weeks and months to come. So we appreciate your time. Cool. Thank you. OK, uh, we're going to move on to uh, one of our last two talks of the evening. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dennis, one of our developers from the front end team, uh, to come in. He's going to talk about writing UI plugins. Um, and then our last talk of the evening, just as a bit of housekeeping, uh, Jaeger will be back to talk about um, our Team City instance internally at JetBrains uh, and how we're using Team City to build Team City, deploy Team City. Uh, everything happens in Team City. So uh, stick around for that. Um, Dennis, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, hi, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, hi there. My name is Dennis and I'm a front end developer in JetBrains. Uh, during this session, I would like to share some updates regarding the plugin development in Team City. I will divide my speech on two parts. The first one, the plugin ecosystem overview, and the second one, the code overview. Let me emphasize, most of the updates I will share next relate to the UI part of plugins. That means JavaScript, TypeScript. Of course, I will slightly touch the backend development part, but uh, I believe we already have an amazing documentation for plugin development on the backend. And of course, if you will have any questions, feel free to uh, ask uh, us using the chat. So, plugins are essential part of Team City since its birthday. 
Uh, during the almost 15 years, developers wrote plugins for different purposes, starting from the simple build notificator, uh, as on your screen, hello, Chuck Norris, to the integrations with AWS, Docker Hub, etc. As a result, after 15 years, uh, we have 399 public plugins you can find in the repository. But there is a nuance. Only three of them are marked as UI plugins. On the other hand, we often see that many users write their own plugins for the UI, but do not publish them in the plugin repository. So as a result, we decided that it's, it is a good time to make development life, uh, developers' life easier. And so we started to refurbish uh, our UI plugin development uh, approaches. So we found some issues. First, first of all, the documentation. We didn't cover user interface integrations in a good manner. For the entire plugin development documentation, we have only one separate page for web UI extensions. Second, we didn't provide API for the UI integrations. Therefore, plugins appealed to the DOM hierarchy. Developers had no useful utilities to visualize their plugins as Tincity does. As a result, a bunch of plugins which look, look and acts not in the way TeamCity does. And in the worst case, some plugins could lead you to memory leaks and performance issues. And uh, as we mentioned uh, a few times today, uh, two years ago, we have presented, uh, we have introduced uh, the Sakura UI. Uh, it's a single page application. Uh, it's a application. It is application built on top of the React and Redux. And uh, that means that uh, the uh, scheme we used before, uh, that means a request, a generation, response, became a part of the past. Nowadays, the application is built on top of a REST client architecture. Starting the 2020.2, we provide a new API to integrate UI plugins in both Sakura and the classic UI. Despite the fact I will mostly talk about the React plugins are framework agnostics, so you can use plain JavaScript as well as Angular, Vue, and other libraries. As you can see on your screens right now, there is a static analyzer plugin made with uh, made by our teammates, uh, not from the Team City team, but a uh, separate team. And this is a good, I think this is an excellent uh, example of integration, third party library, th third party plugin into the main and Sak Sakura UI. So first of all, we will provide a new JavaScript API. You can declaratively Add a plugin to UI. Second, we provide some development tools. Uh, for example, as you can see here, if you will load your UI using the plugin development mode, you will see place IDs. Uh, on your screenshots, there were uh, some place IDs. I will get that to, to them uh, a little bit later. Apart from that, we will also provide some plenty, plenty useful logs. For example, on your screen right now, you can see that uh, there are life cycles, and this is uh, also one new uh, big addition to the plugin development. Uh, we added life cycles and plugin UI context to the plugins, and it will help you to uh, follow the current plugin state. We also prepared TypeScript and flow typings. I know this screen could be uh, could be look over complicated, but this is how definitions look. And uh, uh, I just wanted to make sure that we have prepared typings, and those typings will be hooked up with your IDE, uh, IntelliJ IDEA, WebStorm, or other any smart IDEs. So, and also by releasing the new plugin approaches, we uh, try to make it easier to use modern JavaScript. Uh, on your screens, you can see right now that uh, the, we can use imports, const, uh, async, await operations, or arrow functions. About, uh, about the applicability, there are some ideas for plugins. Some of them we work on right now. Some of them may, may encourage you to write something new. As I mentioned before, there is a static code analysis. Uh, my colleagues before mentioned uh, integrations with Bitbucket or GitLab, for example. You can write any dashboards, any integrations with ana analytics. For example, you've built your application and pinned it. 
And starting the deploy, you will send the analytics data using the build number. From now on, you can make an fetch to the analytics service and download the data regarding the build. How many users downloaded the build? How much can countries you affected? How good the con conversion and other metrics? How many JavaScript or null pointer exceptions appeared in this build? Of course, it's also applicable to integration with marketing, sales, support uh, systems. For example, you can just list uh, Zendesk tickets on your build or uh, reports average amount of uh, tickets. Social networking, it's 2020. Maybe you would like to share your uh, builds uh, or your builds artifacts with the community. And uh, I would like to mention that Sakura UI itself is a plugin. It's really a Java controller plugin. And uh, you know, the only goal of this plugin is to put the JavaScript bundle, which generates a new page. Actually, uh, writing plugins uh, was possible before in classic UI. Uh, what's different now? Uh, we made a teaser and possible uh, possible to use it and to write plugins in declarative way. The last benefit is that you are not required to write much Java code. Of course, you can. If your plugin depends on the internal team city data, the model stays the same as it was before. We have prepared a boilerplate to start the plugin development. The only goal of this Java code is to register your plugin in a TMCT core and download JavaScript files. If you are encouraged to uh, give it a try, I recommend you to start from a TMCT plugin development documentation. Uh, you can scan the QR code or follow the link. And uh, on this front uh, documentation, you can see uh, some useful information. I will scroll my, I will switch my screen to the documentation and show you some stuff. So, uh, first of all, the documentation explains some new terms. Uh, for example, we introduced uh, uh, terms like basic, controlled, and spy UI plugins. We also introduced lifecycle hooks and plugin UI context. The documentation will help you to understand how it works. And there is also a demo plugin repository when, where you can download the uh, pl plugin examples and give it a try. Uh, in the remaining time, I will dive deeper into the code. I will show you the simplest plugin, which is based on the REST communication with two sources of data, TeamCity itself and the JetBrains space. Uh, we, uh, we mentioned before about the space. It's our uh, new product. It's uh, integrated team environment. It has many cool features, but the main cool, main feature we are interested in is a team directory. It is a database of employees. So this is my interface. This is my local host, and it's, uh, it's not empty, of course. And here you can see that there is a plugin uh, which uh, does, this, uh, does the next thing. As you can see, there is a committer in this file, uh, in this build. Uh, it's me. And for some reasons, I would like to get the information about this committer. For example, get, uh, I would like to get, uh, get the phone number. And maybe I would like to have a rise a concern button uh, to call some uh, colleagues to review the code or to call uh, the colleagues uh, to <clears throat> double check something. So, um, how it works. First of all, I request data from the backend of uh, Team City. I will show you how to do. And then, uh, based on the user email of this committer, I will request a JetBrains space to uh, please give me all the data about this email. Uh, let me go to the code. Uh, yeah, this is the code. <clears throat> Uh, this is a demo repository. As you can see, there it's written demo plugin server, uh, for example. Uh, there are two main vital parts of plugin, demo plugin server itself and the front end part. Let me start from the demo plugin server. It is just a simple controller, Java controller, which re registers your plugin into the TeamCity. I'm opening it. So, 
Uh, what does a controller do? First of all, uh, the main goal of this uh, controller is to register your plugin and then uh, every time Team City uh, renders a page, it calls a method called uh, do handle. And in this method, we call the GSP file. Let me collapse it a little. Yeah. Uh, we call a GSP file, React, GSP, React plugin GSP. And uh, we fill this uh, GSP file with a model. If you are familiar with plugin development uh, we introduced many years ago, uh, it, it should look uh, the same as it was before, uh, except one, one thing, bundle dev URL. This string constant contains a link to a local webpack server. This is a feature that helps you to update your JavaScript plugin incrementally and in live mode without uh, rebuild your plugin. Keep in mind that in this file, we also added this URL to the content security policy, uh, uh, exclude list. And by doing so, we let the team city know that all the requests to the URL uh, on the bundle that URL, in our case, it is a local host 8080. So all the requests to this URL should not be blocked. Um, how does it work? As I mentioned before, every time Team City renders a page, it requests a plugin and calls a method do handle. In the do handle, we request a React plugin GSP. Let me go to the React plugin GSP. This is a file. And it's just the simplest file you can you can ever imagine. Uh, it contains if else, uh, if bundle dev URL is specified, then we'll load the GS file from the uh, local host. Actually, that's pretty much it. In ideal cases, you will not be required to add something to this Java code. Otherwise, we already have an amazing documentation for the backend part of the plugin development. Uh, of course, uh, there are some plugins that, uh, which should require some internal data of uh, Team City. For example, resolving build IDs, build names, or resolving project IDs, uh, gets agents data. Everything you could do using uh, the same way uh, as described it in documentation. And we also covered those cases in the front end documentation in section controlled plugin. So, this is a Java part of a plugin, and let's close it. The second part, the second vital part of our plugin is a front end. As you can see, front end part is a modern, uh, modern application. Uh, it is a React app written with the TypeScript, as you can see here, uh, TypeScript file and TSX file. It is a React uh, for, uh, file extension. We do not insist on using the React nor TypeScript. As I mentioned before, you can use any framework, any language you prefer, even the Kotlin JS. Have you ever have you heard about it? Uh, we, try, we, we gave it a chance and it works and it works good. But right now we have prepared typings only for TypeScript and Flow and prepared some universal utilities. Uh, I will go to them a little bit later. Uh, as long as this is a Node application, Node.js application, you have to download Node modules. Uh, we are aware that uh, not everyone uh, knows how Node.js works and no, not everyone has Node.js installed on his environment. So we prepare a Docker Compose file. Let me show it. This, this is a simple file and uh, using the Docker container, you can build your uh, plugin in isolation without needing to install any uh, Java, Maven, or Node.js no uh, tools. So, uh, in preparing to this speech, I have already launched the terminal and launched the Docker Compose. Uh, it took a while. Um, what uh, did I do? Docker Compose run service ports dev, and using the, this command, I launched. I have launched the Webpack server on 8080 port. And from this time, every time our plugin will, our GSP file will request a bundle JS, it will be requested from the local host, uh, local Webpack uh, instance. 
Webpack instance uh, has two goals. The first one is to host your files. If you will open your uh, web browser and type uh, localhost uh, 8080, you will see that there, there is a bundle.js. And the second goal of the webpack is to incrementally recompile your, um, your plugin. I'm going back to the TeamCity UI to show how it works. So as you can see, there are a few builds. Uh, the second build. In the second build, there are no committers. There are no changes, uh, hence there are no committers, but we still show the developers committed in this build header. It looks excess, redundant, and uh, we have to re remove it. And to do so, I'm going back to my code, to my application, and just add the condition. I have prepared before, but uh, what, what, it what it does. Uh, it just checks if the user list is not empty, and if it's empty, it returns now. So my next move is to just save the application, and it will be recompiled. Let me scroll down. Yeah, compiled successfully. And I just refresh my page, and as you can see, there are no changes, and uh, there is no uh, header. But if we will open it on the build with changes, here we are. Um, what's next? Um, let me close the terminal. Uh, the entry point for the plugin is index.ts file. Every time the plugin system loads a bundle.js, it launches this, this file. And in this file, I want to show you two key features of the new plugin ecosystem. First of all, we import, uh, we import modules from JetBrains TeamCity API and uh, we import files. That means that uh, from now on, you can write your UI plugins using the modern JavaScript. And the second key feature is a plugin constructor. I have selected it. Oops, yeah. Uh, what is the plugin constructor? Uh, it is a simple function which receives two arguments. Uh, simply saying it's, uh, it is uh, where to put the plugin here, and the second, what the plugin is. Let me start from where to put. You can use get parameter called plugin development mode. Uh, I'm going back to the interface, and here I can specify the parameter. Everything is described in the plugin documentation. Uh, so uh, feel free to get there. So if I open interface with plugin development pods, it appears some place IDs, some containers. Each of these containers uh, has its own name, and those names are unique. And you can just select the place ID name, copy it, and paste it to the to your uh, constructor. That's how plugin ecosystem decides where to render your plugin. We have prepared place IDs for both the Sakura UI. Uh, as you can see, uh, there are place IDs in the header, in sidebar, and we also prepared some plugin, plugin containers for old UI. Let me show it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we try to keep the old UI as it was before. So uh, all the plugins written before 20.2 20, 20 will work as they were working. If you update them to, and uh, there is a, uh, not a complicated way to update them to be useful in Sakura UI. So I close the old, uh, I close the classic UI and go back to the new UI. Uh, that's how plugin containers work. Uh, what next? Um, as I mentioned before, we have prepared some typings, and if you would like to put your place ID somewhere else, you can just uh, get a list of all possible uh, uh, place IDs and select whatever you want to use, 
And uh, as you can see, there are a lot of place IDs we have prepared, but uh, we are open to receive any feedback to add any new place IDs. So the second part, um, what the plugin is. Uh, this is the second argument, and it receives more options. The name. name, plugin name is used as an unique ID of plugin. Along with the place ID, name makes a uh, uh, unique key, key, value, key value pair in the plugin registry. Plugin registry is a store for, the, for plugins. In most cases, you will not work with this registry directly. But sometimes it will help you to get to the instance of a plugin. See more in section control plugins and documentations. Content. Content is uh, one more option. Content is a vital part of your plugin. Without content, uh, the plugin doesn't make any sense. So it could be a React component, as in our case, because we love React. Uh, it could be HTML node, and it could be stream. Uh, for example, let me show you. I just write, uh, it should be hello world, of course. Um, as usual, I press uh, common test and then update the UI. Hope it will work from scratch. Uh, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. One moment. Ah, yeah. Uh, hello world. Uh, why? Uh, why it appeared here. As you can see, this plugin is registered for the Sakura build before content, and uh, previously I, I showed, showed you Sakura build line expanded uh, content. So anyway, content could be uh, DOM nodes, it could be string, and it could be the React uh, element. Uh, let me get back. Uh, and options. We have prepared uh, some options. Uh, it could be useful for you. Uh, for example, debug. Uh, using debug option, you can make the plugin report uh, useful data about the current state of a pl uh, plugin. For example, uh, what's the current context of the plugin? Uh, what is the uh, place of this plugin? Let me show it in, in the code. I just opened the console. And here we are. It is a set of useful data. As you can see, uh, there are some uh, lifecycle events called on mount, on unmount. Uh, there are also on context update. All those life cycles are described in documentation. Uh, and here we can just uh, have a quick look uh, what is the current con context is. Uh, next. Uh, I think uh, it's it is it's it uh, that's it about the plugin uh, plugin constructor uh, and the last part uh, the content itself uh, I'm going to fgs t6 this file fgs and I will not get deep into how React works I do understand that uh, not everybody likes uh, React but uh, the first thing. Whenever the, our plugin is rendered, we make a request to the uh, REST API, uh, Team City REST API. For this, we use a, a wait utils request JSON. Let me wrap the text. Yep. Utils request JSON. Here we request all the changes data, including the user data, email, ID, and, uh, and name. Uh, I highlight that request JSON is a utility predefined in JetBrains SimCity API. So uh, its goal is, it handles all the authentication headers. So the only matter you have to worry about is what to receive from the backend, not how, know how to authorize, but what you want to receive. Uh, the next important thing about React uh, plugins. Uh, when we start the request, we set loading is true. That means uh, whenever, uh, while we are requesting the data, we shouldn't show any useful da uh, any data except the loader. And while interface is still loading, we write uh, if loading, return loader inline. 
what's the magic uh, what's the magic here loader inline let me show you at the top of the page loader inline is a company it is a small brick uh, and the entire sakura ui is built on top of small bricks uh, called uh, ring ui it is our internal ui library you can import any component from uh, ring ui as well as from other React uh, libraries, uh, and that's how you can make your plugin look and act, behave like Team City does. Uh, for example, uh, as our static analysis team did. So, uh, what happens next? Uh, when we finish loading the data using the request JSON, we just simply deduplicate the user emails, uh, user emails because there could be possibly. Uh, one committer who committed uh, to, committed uh, two or more commits, uh, and we have to deduplicate it. And then, uh, if application not is loading and the user list is not empty, we are going to the next brick of our plugin, user profile. And I'm going to user profile. Here, uh, the last part of the plugin where we make a request to the third party service. In our case, it is a JetBrains space, but feel free to use any other services you would like to. Let me get into the request user info. Uh, as you can see, this is just a request to space URL and some endpoint. Um, so what happens at, uh, finally, when we load all the data, we simply render the React component uh, and render the profile name, first name, last name, and uh, of course, masked phone number. So that was a short overview about the React plugins. Uh, let me point and highlight one more time that it's, uh, it will work not only with React uh, plugins, uh, React components, but uh, with any JavaScript framework. And uh, um, I think uh, it's pretty much it. Uh, feel free to ask me any questions. And if you would like to start the plugin development, uh, I recommend you to go to the documentation and see how it works. Uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thanks, Tadness. That was uh, really helpful. So um, you know, just to reiterate, if you guys are interested in developing UI plugins, um, it's definitely an area we haven't seen a ton of action on over the last few years, uh, but we wanted to make the resources available uh, and easier for to use. So um, if you have questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, Dennis, one question I have for you. Um, mm -hmm. When we're talking about the new secure UI in these front end plugins, can you talk a little bit about the backwards compatibility between uh, plugins you might be developing for the secure UI and how that's going to mm -hmm. relate to the classic UI? So, uh, first of all, uh, all the plugins written before the 2020.2 will work the same. And uh, you can write, uh, you can use previously written plugin in every version, uh, including the 2020.2. If you would like to integrate your plugin into the LTUI, uh, there possibly uh, will be some workarounds. Uh, because we have no place ID in previous versions of Team City, uh, for example, in 2019. And uh, that means somewhere in your code will be just uh, if else. Uh, that means uh, uh, you have to check what's the current uh, version. Uh, we have a predefined its utilities to get the current Team City build number, for example, or major version. And based on this data, you can render one GSP or render the modern JavaScript uh, file. OK, great. Um, and then if folks want to develop plugins, whether they're UI plugins uh, or uh, just regular plugins for Team City, can they submit those to the plugin marketplace? What, what's the process for that look like? Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, we haven't uh, yet uh, described this way uh, in documentation, so I think I have to uh, write this because uh, right now I cannot answer this. Maybe some of colleagues can help me. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I, 
So I, I can talk a little bit generally to the process. Uh, if you're interested in submitting a plugin to our marketplace uh, that you've developed for either an integration you're using um, or something open source, uh, reach out to our support team and we'll help route that in the right direction so we can uh, get it hosted on the uh, JetBrains marketplace. Um, all right, I uh, appreciate uh, your time, Dennis. Uh, this was a really helpful talk. Uh, hopefully we'll see uh, more plugins in our marketplace uh, here shortly. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we're coming up on our last talk of the day. So I'd like to invite uh, Yegor back to the stage. Uh, we're really gonna dig into uh, how the sausage is made, uh, give you a peek behind the curtain and show you how we're uh, building Team City. So um, I'm really excited for this talk. I'll turn it over to you, Yegor. Yeah, thank you, David. And hello, everyone. Um, hello again for those who stayed with us from the very beginning and uh, to those who have just joined. Uh, my name is uh, Yegor Naumov, and I'm the product marketing manager here at uh, JetBrains. And yeah, so in this talk, I'm going to be talking about how we use TeamCity inside JetBrains to build TeamCity. So as you all know, uh, most of you, I guess, use TeamCity on a daily basis. Uh, Team City is the CI and CDE server for customers like yourselves. But inside T uh, inside JetBrains, for building Team City itself as a product, we also need a CI solution. So naturally, we look to Team City as a user for our CI and CD pipelines. And uh, we mentioned earlier today that uh, Team City is uh, released. Uh, twice a year, we release major releases twice a year and uh, minor releases uh, up to uh, five times between those. Uh, but internally at JetBrains, we release TeamCity daily. So each day uh, there is a new build of TeamCity that we uh, release to the internal users and that we then, after a number of such releases, publicly announce as a new release of TeamCity. So this is called dog footing. So dog footing is an essential part of uh, how JetBrains builds products, not just TeamCity, but all our products, IntelliJ ID, ReSharper, Rider, PHP Storm, you name it. Uh, everything inside uh, of JetBrains uh, is being dog footed. That means that our employees use our own tools and the same is true uh, with TeamCity. So we have an internal server that is called a build server, uh, which we use to uh, provide CI for all our products internally. And this same build server also uh, uses, uh, we, use, we use it as a CI and CD for TeamCity itself. Uh, and the build server deploys a new version of itself every night. And then the cycle continues. Uh, we again start using the server. So this all kind of reminds me of the Inception movie and how we need to go deeper to understand what's happening on the next level. Uh, so a couple of words about the a couple of stats about the build server itself. Uh, it's a single installation. Uh, we have, uh, by saying single installation, I mean uh, it's we don't have multiple TeamCity servers here and there with uh, the project split up between them. No, it's just a single installation. But we have uh, several secondary node uh, nodes, uh, and on this uh, installation uh, there's. Uh, uh, 1,500 uh, build agents. Uh, of course, this number differs, differs throughout the day. Uh, we might have uh, a lower number in the night and then a higher number in some of the peak hours, but we've, we're hitting over uh, the 1,500 mark like every day now. Uh, there's 6,000 6, projects, uh, 40,000 build configurations, uh, 300,000 builds per day, and uh, there is more than 1,000 users on this internal build server. Uh, and if talking about our setup, it's, there are basically three three pieces of uh, of Team City. So first is the Team City core, it's the the backend part of Team City where all the main functionality lives, kind of. And for that, we use a, a single Git repository. It's uh, mostly built on uh, uh, Java with Java and Spring, some Kotlin in there. Uh, and for Git hosting, we use our internal uh, JetBrains space Git hosting. Uh, for our TeamCity front end, uh, so the, that all that awesome React uh, stuff that Dennis was just talking about, uh, it's also a single Git repository, more or it's the same Git repository as we use for the TeamCity core. Uh, as far as the technology stack goes, it's React plus, plus Redux, Flow, and Ring, Ring UI, which is uh, our internally built uh, UI. Uh, but 
in addition to those two components, there's also uh, a bunch of bundled plugins uh, for it's more than 50 uh, last time I counted. And uh, for that, there's a bunch of different version control systems. Uh, we have, uh, of course, we have Git for many of them, but there's also Perforce, Subversion, Mercurial, TFS, uh, and uh, a number of broader uh, set of technology stacks, starting from Kotlin, Java, Spring to Microsoft.net. Uh, so this is kind of uh, the diversity that we have to deal with, and uh, we deal with it uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and so Here's our workflow for, for the Team City core part. Uh, I'll talk about the Team City front end part a bit later as they have a bit of a different uh, workflow. Uh, but for Team City core, it's a trunk based development. So during the day, all the commits go directly to the trunk. So, like the random commits, uh, we have uh, 20 from 20 to 40 commits per day on average, depending on the day, depending on how close we are to the release, how many people are on vacation, et cetera. But generally, that's not the, that's the number. Um, so we make those commits in the trunk during the day. Uh, and then during the night, uh, a review build is triggered on the build server. Uh, now, I have to uh, make a note here that uh, most of our development team is kind of uh, within the same uh, time zones. I think we, we're generally split up uh, four hours between the uh, the earliest and the later time zones. So uh, for us, uh, the day and the night is is more or less uh, is more or less the uniform uh, uh, time timings timings in the day. So uh, the day is where do, we do the work, and the night is where there's uh, fewer commits, uh, fewer people active, and uh, there's fewer uh, things happening on the build server. So during the night, we uh, we trigger the build server review build that takes these all these commits and uh, runs them through a bunch of tests. And by the next morning, we have a build uh, ready to be reviewed by the team. Uh, so what does it do uh, during the night? Uh, and the nightly build basically builds all the binaries of Team City, packages them as, as an archive. And this is basically the same uh, thing that we publish uh, on our website when we release Team City. It's just a different version because it's a different build number. Uh, and uh, yeah, but generally uh, it's the same. Um, to get to that, uh, the, all the commits run through a bunch of tests. So there's one big set of tests uh, for uh, our integration and unit tests. It's uh, more than uh, two, uh, 20,000 tests that take uh, more than uh, one hour. And uh, we run them in parallel on multiple agents, but they still take quite, quite a long time. And there's a, a couple of dozen of system tests, which actually make sure that uh, Team City can be stood up, that you can extend, you can install and connect an agent to Team City, that the uh, the protocol works, so like key system functionality works, and uh, and then there is a, a kind of aggregating uh, composite build here, so. Uh, so this build server review build is a composite build. As you can see, uh, it, it's, it lets you see like all the commits in one place, it lets you see the results of all the tests in one place. It uh, sums up the tests from uh, the uh, integration and unit tests and from the build server uh, system tests. And everything is shown in uh, this uh, build server review build. And, uh, I have to also make a short note that this uh, view of the build chain that I'm showing to you, it's a condensed view. And uh, on, on this slide, I just, I just took a quick uh, screencast of uh, what the actual pipeline looks like. It's a bit more builds than uh, you saw on the previous slide, but just to give you a scale of uh, uh, what it looks like. All right, so that was the backend part. That was the Team City core part and actually the the bundle plugins, uh, they basically go through the same process as I showed you for the Team City Core. Uh, the front end process is a bit different. So, uh, for the front end, they don't do, uh, commit directly into trunk, uh, but they use uh, uh, feature branches for that. And basically, developers, uh, if they want their, uh, their feature to be their commit to be merged, uh, they need to name the branch uh, starting with the auto merge prefix uh, so that the merge robot then picks it up 
and uh, based on that, uh, on, on the prefix in the branch name, it will start a build. Uh, and this is uh, possible thanks to the um, branch build trigger uh, in Team City. And you can just edit the branch builder to be uh, only listening to this auto merge uh, prefix and only start builds uh, when a commit to a branch with auto merge happens. And for those uh, commits that developers don't want to get built right away, uh, they just use some other na differently named uh, branch names. Uh, further on, uh, their commits uh, go through, uh, so Team City prefers the, a rebase and it runs their commits through a, several groups of tests. So there are linters, structural tests, why did you render special specific uh, uh, React UI tests and a number of accessibility tests. And only after all those checks are passed, uh, it merges all the commits into trunk. Uh, and I just wanted to give you an example of uh, what it looks like inside Team City uh, for and what they actually work with inside Team City. So when Team City reports test results, uh, you can it can do multiple things. It doesn't just show failed or successful build. Uh, it, it can also show uh, build history. And for example, for our front end builds. Uh, you can actually attach different metadata. For example, like in this case, uh, their, tasks, their tests contain a number of screenshots where the tool takes a screenshot of, uh, of the changes in the UI and then shows you the, like a difference between the, an older successful build uh, screenshot and this new screenshot. And if there is a difference, it will fail the build and notify the developers. Which is a pretty, pretty cool thing to, uh, to debug visual changes, I think. All right, so we've gone through uh, those processes. We've uh, merged into uh, trunk. What next? Uh, then, after the build, uh, the build server review build passes. Uh, Team City sends a notification to the special channel in our Slack, and what it does here, it mentions uh, four people who are on build server duty, and uh, there are two people for front end, two people for the back end part. Uh, it mentions those people, it sends a link to the latest build, it shows the status of that build and just some uh, basic uh, stats of like how many, how many tests, uh, tests have passed, how many uh, changes have been, um, have made it into this build, etc. So after that, the people on duty uh, open the link, uh, open the build server, and they uh, basically review the changes. And this is a manual review process. Uh, what they do is they open the changes tab and just go through the commits that made it into this build and just make sure that their goal is to make sure that there are no breaking changes. There's no changes that could break the uh, like agent server communication or any cleanup changes that could delete all the build history data from, uh, from our build server so that nothing uh, catastrophic will, uh, can break. And there's also a secondary goal to share knowledge. This is basically a code review. So uh, developers can share knowledge between themselves uh, on how to implement something in a more optimal way or what's the best way to uh, uh, make a change to a specific subsystem of Team City. And if a breaking change is found during this review process, uh, we have to stop the process. We have to stop the chain. Uh, and there are basically from here, there are two ways to go. Well, one is we don't release a new build of the build server this day. Uh, and two, we implement a hotfix. And I'll mention, I'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, but from here, on the other hand, if everything is good, uh, we trigger the merge um, into the mass, into the build server branch. Uh, so Team City will take all those changes from day zero uh, and it will merge trunk onto the build server branch. And uh, uh, note here that the new commits that came over like during the night or during the day one on this scheme, they will not make it into here because they didn't go, they did not go through the, uh, through the build chain before, they didn't go through all the checks. They will make it into the next build on the next, uh, the next night basically. And one more cool thing about this, remember I mentioned you that we have uh, over 50 different uh, bundle plugins, each of, each of which lives in their own repository. So this merge operation is not a single merge. It's a merge across 50 different repositories. And uh, what Team City does here, it basically merges 
uh, 50 different commits and 50 different repositories all onto the same uh, build server branch. And what it does, it, it takes the snapshot of, the, of when those commits happened. And this helps it merge the commits over the same time frame, over the same uh, specific uh, time point when they happened into the uh, same branch. So this is basically only possible with the, the snapshot dependencies within Team City. And this is a pretty cool uh, feature, I think. Okay, so if everything is good from this point, uh, we will uh, again build a uh, uh, the binaries of Team City, package them in, uh, in the archive. Uh, there's another quick check by the people on duty during the same day, and if everything is good, then uh, they manually apply one of the tags, either a deploy tag or or deploy manual tag, and these these are the tags within Team City, so they just put the tag on the build on the finished build and. Uh, Team City monitors for this, uh, and the build server starts uh, another part. So the build server now starts the upgrade of the build server. And yeah, here we have the uh, the trigger, uh, the uh, start build trigger that watches for some specific uh, uh, tag. In this case, deploy manual. The difference between deploy and deploy manual is not is not that big. Basically, the deploy starts like in the middle of the night, and deploy. Ma ma Deploy manual starts of the, on the, closer to the morning when there's someone who can kind of uh, watch over that build just in case something goes wrong. Uh, yeah, right. So uh, from day zero, we uh, merge into the build server branch, and on that branch, we start from that branch. We start the build server upgrade procedure uh, on on the night one, uh, and this this is how it works. So. Uh, our build server lives on a machine uh, uh, which is locally hosted on the on one of the our vSphere uh, window VMs, and there's a dedicated build agent that lives on the same machine, and this build agent is only dedicated to this specific uh, build configuration. So you could see here on the left, uh, there is this. It lives in its own spe special pool, and there's only. Uh, two uh, build agents are in this pool, server maintenance, and all these agents do, they just run these build server upgrade builds. They don't run any other builds. Uh, this is quite important. So this dedicated build agent it lives on the same node as the build server. Uh, it, first, what it does, it downloads all the binaries from the build server, then it stops this build server. and because the server is stopped, then there is no access to it, neither by the users uh, of Team City of the build server, nor by the agents of the build server. This means uh, uh, our all the traffic is redirected, rerouted to our secondary server, which, while the main build server is down, uh, is stood up and it takes on all the load, basically, from the users and from the build agents. And then the agent replaces the files on the server on the machine and restarts the server. Uh, another cool thing about this process is, is that at this time, when this agent is performing all those actions, and while the build server is down, the agent also report, reports its progress and the build logs and all the results of those of the of the build to that secondary uh, Team City node. So uh, any user can just open that build and just watch in real time the progress as this agent is updating the build server. So once the build server is uh, restarted, the we don't need the secondary node uh, traffic uh, anymore, and the users are. Uh, uh, can go back again to the build server. The agents can also report directly to the build server from this point. And now, uh, after this action, we start the upgrade of our uh, secondary node. This is the uh, VCS node, as we uh, name it. And it's basically the same process. There is also a build agent that lives on the machine where the secondary node lives, and it, it, it does exactly the same uh, process as I just showed you. Uh, and also, while that is happening, because we've upgraded the build server to uh, a new build of Team City, uh, all the agents also need to be upgraded. And so all the agents, including that same agent that was performing this upgrade, they uh, start the upgrade to a new version automatically. So the cool thing here is that, first of all, the agent can uh, continue the build without the main server being up. And second of all, that while with having this secondary uh, node of Team City, this same agent can report the progress to that secondary node 
during it's updating the the uh, initial uh, main node of, of the build server. I don't know. To me, it's uh, it's it's pretty mind blowing how it works. All right, so I I uh, promised to tell you about how the hotfixes work, and this is it. So uh, sometimes uh, it it so happens that we need to implement some hotfix. Uh, after the initial build is built and after we've uh, merged uh, our trunk commits onto the build server branch. And uh, yes, we can do that. We, we do that after that, uh, that merge operation. So whenever there is a uh, hotfix, a commit with a hotfix, we can cherry pick it from the trunk, trunk branch and merge it onto the uh, build server branch. And Again, start the build server upgrade already with that change in the uh, list of changes. So in summary, uh, each commit makes it uh, into the production the day uh, after the next one. So if I make a change to Team City today, uh, everyone at JetBrains, all 1,000 1, users across uh, 40,000 different build configurations receive the change and they can use it like the day after it was made. And this is our uh, core process here at JetBrains. We love dog footing. We love using our own tools. Uh, and this is how we set up our continuous deployment. But then the next day, everything continues. Everything uh, happens again in the same cycle. And going back to movie references, that reminds me of the Groundhog Day uh, movie. And uh, the process repeats itself. So yeah, that was, uh, that was it. There's was a short story how we uh, develop TeamCity internally, how we use Team City to do that. Uh, hope you liked it, and I'm open for any questions. That's great, thanks, Igor. Um, this is always a really interesting process. I remember when I first joined JetBrains and learned that uh, this is how we're uh, building and deploying Team City with itself. Uh, uh, my mind was also blown a little bit. Um, so we don't have any uh, major questions in the chat. One of the things I wanted to ask is um, oh, one just came in. You know, from a Team City build agent perspective, I know a lot of customers I talk to are trying to figure out where should we host these build agents? How do we run them? So just out of curiosity, you know, what are we doing internally at JetBrains? Uh, where do we host the bulk of our build agents? And I know it's spread out across a bunch of different development projects, but could you talk to that generally? Yeah, generally, well, it's, it's hard to tell uh, uh, decisively because they're, as you said, spread out. There is more than 1,500 build agents uh, across different projects. We have a bunch of them in the cloud on AWS. We have a bunch of them on-premise uh, running uh, on some of our uh, like hardware, basically, in our offices. Uh, we also have the internal uh, v, uh, vSphere set up uh, with the private cloud. And as I mentioned, this is where our build server runs. So for example, our the agent that upgrades the build server that I mentioned uh, is uh, hosted on that same uh, VM uh, on the on the vSphere. And it's, a, it's just a Windows uh, machine, basically. So yeah, kind of all over the place, uh, wherever uh, people need them, wherever their uh, projects uh, need, need to be built. Uh, we have, I think, uh, everything here internally. Great. Yeah, another question that I frequently get is uh, from customers who are trying to figure out where they want to host their Team City infrastructure is, you know, what platform are you using? What database are you using? And I usually point them to the documentation. We do support a number of different databases and a number of different uh, operating systems. You know, Team City is a Java application, so it can run just about anywhere. Uh, but what are we doing internally uh, at JetBrains, if that's information you can share? Yeah, we're we're on Windows. Uh, we're in terms of the machine themselves. We run. Uh, I think it, they're run on like uh, yeah, as I said, v, uh, vSphere with uh, Intel Xeons for our main node. We it's it's a pretty bulky machine with uh, sixty with thirty six uh, CPUs and uh, over seventy gigs of RAM. But also for the secondary node, it's it's basically the same type of machine, but with a bit of a uh, like lighter specs, like it's a smaller Intel Xeon with 16, I think, CPUs and uh, 50 gigabyte RAM. Right. Um, yeah. And we were having some good discussions earlier today in the chat. Uh, if your Team City server is experiencing heavy loads, a lot of times that comes from VCS polling. Uh, so we would recommend, you know, maybe setting up a multi node architecture uh, or one of the better things you can do in those cases is set up commit hooks uh, so that. You're pulling intervals if you're pulling, you know, 
10,000, 100,000 VCS routes, uh, you know, maybe you're not doing that anymore. That's a good way to reduce the load. A um, couple other questions from the chat. Uh, and I don't know if you know the answer to this. How many commits per day uh, on average go through your pipeline uh, before we get into the nightly build, at least on the Team City side? Yeah, so as I checked, it was from 20 to 40 commits, something around uh, uh, those uh, lines. Of course, as I said, depending on the number of developers uh, uh, basically in the office or working from home these days, uh, depending on the, on the day of the week, et cetera, it can be more or less, but in general, it's uh, tens of commits. Yeah. Uh, can you talk generally about our process for uh, rollbacks or backups when things go wrong? <laughs> yeah, well, we can do that manually, basically. Uh, but the, yeah, I was, I was very interested in that, like how do we, if something goes wrong, what happens? And generally the pipeline itself, uh, uh, the way we have it set up, uh, rarely anything goes wrong. Uh, knock it on looks wood, like, right? yeah, <laughs> knock on wood. Uh, so, but historically, we we have not had uh, many problems with this pipeline. And when it does, uh, so there are people on duty that I mentioned that overview that deployment process, uh, and they can kind of take over and just manually uh, restore uh, build, the build server from the backup. Yeah, um, I'd say one of the advantages of the process we're running here, you know, especially if you're a customer who has a, a critical bug fix, um, oftentimes we can produce emergency uh, releases of Team City if you're encountering a bug fix that uh, is really causing some serious problems in your environment. Um, that's a situation you obviously want to escalate uh, to support uh, to your account rep, to myself. Um, but if it's uh, something that we've been able to implement a fix, we may be able to get you uh, an early version before uh, the main release. Um, one of the last questions in here uh, sort of relates to our backend processes. And we're obviously building a lot of projects internally at JetBrains, all of our IDEs, um, our external tools. Uh, how do we manage build priorities between different projects? Uh, and Justin mentions that some of their projects tend to have a lot of chain build configurations. Um, and it could quickly use up all of the available agents. So yeah. and what are some of the best practices for making sure uh, projects have agents available? Um, yeah. Not buying more licenses. Justin, we would love to have <laughs> you buy more licenses, uh, but obviously that's not feasible. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a universal answer. Just get everyone a bill, bill agent, that's it. Right. Uh, yeah, but seriously, so uh, I would say agent pools is something that you need to utilize in that case. Just uh, split your agent in different pools, assign those uh, pools to a limited number of projects and just have those build agents only build uh, run builds from, the, from those projects. Uh, yeah, so the very edge case scenario that uh, I mentioned in our presentation where there was a one build agent assigned to one specific build configuration, that's a very edge case scenario. You don't probably want to do that uh, just because it will be idle most of the time. Uh, but assigning agent pools to a number of projects uh, would definitely make sense. Yeah, and this is another scenario, you know, we've been talking about it all day where um, being able to utilize cloud profiles, whether that's with on-premise uh, VMware vSphere agents or with cloud agents through AWS can really be beneficial because uh, Team City is going to manage pulling available licenses and returning those back to the pool when they're uh, when they're available. Oh, uh, and of course, the move to top functionality <laughs> to promote your builds to the top of the queue. Yeah, sure. If you have the the permissions, <laughs> you you can always use that as well. Yeah, always helpful just, to just be kidding. an administrator, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, uh, great. Uh, we really appreciate the talk. Um, everyone who's stuck with us here through the end, we really have had a good conversation in the chat. Uh, so if you're watching a recording, uh, might be worthwhile to dig through those. Otherwise, there's plenty of ways you can uh, engage with us um, after the talk. So uh, again, thank you guys for joining. We will be posting a recording of all these talks on our YouTube channel at JetBrains TV. So uh, like and subscribe. I've always wanted to say that, so that feels fun. Um, mm -hmm. And if you want to engage with us directly, uh, our U-Track is a great place to interact with our developers, post enhancement requests, uh, get updates um, on certain issues. And you can also reach out to us at Team City Support. Uh, make sure you mention that you saw us in the talk. Uh, we'll make sure we route that to the right folks who you may have been having conversations with during the talk today. Um, that's really all we have planned. Uh, hopefully we'll see you on some of these webcasts again in the future. Uh, thanks again for joining. Thanks, Igor.
Thank you. Thanks, David. Have a, have a great day, everyone.